screen on remote control desk. All right, so we are recording now. So we're gonna talk about foundational concepts and exercises. Right, so we're gonna talk about definitions of therapeutic exercises, patient definitions, client definitions, stuff like that. Uh, components of the physical function, we'll talk through these. So balance, postural equilibrium, cardiopulmonary endurance, all this normal stuff we're going through here. So physical function. So physical function used to be considered just, are you physically fit, right? But that's not all a function is, right? Function has to do with a lot of things. Function has to do with muscle performance. Do I have the, yes, am I physically fit? Am I able to do this stuff? But do I have the cardiopulmonary endurance to do this stuff as well? Do I have the mobility and flexibility, neuromuscular control? And a lot of times what you'll find when you're, especially even yourself, what you'll find is you'll end up leaning towards one of these more than the other, right? We have a tendency where you know, you trend towards one of those kind of circles, whereas true function is kind of a nice blending between all of those circles, right? We all see the people at the gym, or at least we did when the gyms were still open, you know, that walk around, that are just, they, they come in and all they do is lift weights all day long, right? And they, the bros, right? And the broskies are huge and they've got huge muscles, but then you have them stand on one foot and it's, um, disaster, right? Or you put them on a treadmill and they're like, I, I don't do cardio, bro, right? But with our patients, remember, we're not looking at those broskies. Most of the patients we're going to deal with are your average ordinary person out, out in the world, right? Especially here in the United States, right? Most of our patients are going to be on multiple medications. Most of our patients are going to be overweight. Most of our patients are going to have other comorbidities. So, even yourselves right now, you know, the way you guys function as human beings now, a lot of times your function is better than most of the patients we're going to see. So you have to be aware and cognitively thinking the whole time you're working with the patient, is this something best for them or am I designing this based on myself and my own personal bias? You have to be thinking about what's best for your patient because not all of them are going to be able to do, you know, bridging on a physio ball. Not all of them are going to be able to do curls with 75 pound dumbbells. And not only that, but not all of them need to do that. So you have to be focusing on the function of the patient, which is why in every therapeutic exercise program, we have to take the concept of what the patient wants into care, right? If the patient wants to get swole, great, we can still help them get swole. But swole may not be where we need to get, right? We don't need to be swole ski, right? We may just need to get to the point where they can walk again. And that's kind of one of the things we have to pay attention to when we're working with these patients is not all the patients want to be, you know, these, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger looking type people. Most of the patients just want to be able to get back to work. Um, and looking at these circles, I'm sure that all of you can look at this and go, there's one of these circles around function that you're weak in, right? For me, I'm going to openly admit mine is mobility and flexibility. Uh, you know, other than my legs, which I stretch every day from being in the martial arts, most of my, the rest of my flexibility is low. I don't, I mean, I'm, and even kicking within the martial arts, my flexibility is not the best. I, I'm old. I'm just going to say it. I'm getting old. You can see the gray hair growing in the goatee here. Um, my flexibility is nowhere near it was when I was 18, when I was 17, right? It's totally changed. As well as my neuromuscular control is kind of off now. It's not as good as it used to be, especially with my neck injury. And cardio, yeah, I don't, I'm not exactly the most cardio fit person. As you can tell, I got a few extra pounds on right? Um, so all of that comes into play, right? I bet a lot of you, if we test in that balance and postural equilibrium control, we can stress that your balance system out. We can get you to the point where you're outside of your comfortable zone in balance. And that's something that's really interesting because all of these have exercises that go along with them. There are exercises for muscle performance. There are exercises for cardiopulmonary. There are exercises for mobility, for neuromuscular control, stability, balance, and if you have to have your patient do them, you have to be able to do them, which means you have to be able to practice those in advance. Going in and having somebody do downward dog is great. If you don't know what you're talking about doing downward dog, then you look like an idiot. So you gotta be able to do and practice what you preach, right? You've gotta be able to tell the patients that. I am gonna use myself as an example. When I went into my PTA program, I was going to Penn State, Mount Alto, 
right? So mont meaning mountain, alto meaning high. The school was literally on the side of a mountain in Southern Pennsylvania. And I felt like those old stories when your dad tells you I walked uphill both ways in newspaper for shoes, kind of the way I felt when I went there because the parking lot, the student parking lots were all down here. The faculty parking lots were all up where the buildings were. The student parking lots were all down here. And to get to my classes, I felt like I was walking. It was literally like half a mile to get from the parking lot to where the PT building was. And when I started, I had just left an IT job where I'm not joking, I was a database admin. I had an office. I never met my boss. I spent eight to 12 hours a day in an office that was 10 by 10. Um, had a great setup, all the stuff I could need, but right outside my office was a nice vending machine. And that vending machine at my work was free. And it had stuff like, you know, snickerdoodle cookies and all kinds of like the, the best day, Amish Danishes you could possibly imagine were in this machine. And so when I needed lunch, the likelihood of me eating my salad was low and the likelihood of me going out and hitting that machine up was pretty high. Or, you know, in the middle of the day, you're like, oh, I need something, pick me up. Ooh, that Danish looks really good. So when I started my PT program, I was my heaviest. It was about 295. And, you know, walking up and down those hills, man, I got about halfway up and, okay, that guy needs a break. And I had to take a break and I realized this. And I went to a course, one of the student PTA, the, the, like the events that they're hosting for you guys with the student SIGs, where it was students matched up with other clinicians. And one of the questions they asked, and it was, how many PTs and PTAs in this class can't get patients to follow their exercise program? And people raised their hands. And I looked around at the people that were raising their hands, and they were all me. They were all, you know, 300, 400 pounds, big guys. They're sitting there with plates. So I'm not joking. The one guy sitting right beside me that got matched up with was about 315 and had four donuts sitting on his plate in the morning. And I looked at him and I said, <laughs> I didn't say it literally, I thought in my head. Yeah, no wonder no one's following your exercise program. Do, 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 do you see? And then I looked down at myself and I went, oh. And so I had to make some structural changes to myself as well. And I dropped quite a bit of weight from where I was back then. I'm still not the lightest I've ever been, but I've never since fifth grade been below 225. I was a big kid, I'm just saying. So think about yourself too. Think about what you're putting out there. I hate when I hear people say that somebody that's overweight can't train me. You know, if you're not, if you don't look like I want to look, you can't help me out. That's not true. I can help out a lot of bodybuilders and I'm not a bodybuilder because I know the structure of muscles. I know how things work. But I also don't want to look like a sloven mess when I'm training patients because that's kind of the impression you get, right? That first impression is kind of very important. Um, that's why I kind of, I, I like scrubs because of the, you know, ease of wearing them. And if you get stuff on them, they get out. But scrubs also make us look like giant boxes. They just do. Uh, so types of therapeutic exercise. We talked about aerobic conditioning and reconditioning, right? When we talk aerobic conditioning and reconditioning, what is, what are we working on? What's, what's the goal of an aerobic conditioning program? Is it strength or is it endurance? Endurance? Yeah, endurance, right? There's a little bit of strength. There's a strength component to it, but the primary thing is endurance is the main part of it, right? We need to be able to go for longer and longer and longer, right? That's the idea of aerobic conditioning. Aerobic meaning using oxygen, right? And you know, when you get on that treadmill and you're going for a little while, that oxygen usage definitely goes up, right? You start, so, well, maybe it's just me. Um, but, you know, I get about, you know, probably half the way through my 5k that I normally run and I'm getting a little winded right and I've got to rethink about my breathing and the way I'm doing things so that I can keep going for the rest of what I'm working out with so aerobic condition is important with muscle performance we have strength we have power we have endurance right stretching techniques we have muscle lengthening and joint mobilizations because sometimes just stretching the muscle is not enough because we can have all of our shoulder muscles loose, but again, if that joint capsule is compromised, we're still not going to get normal range of motion in the shoulder. So we may have to manipulate the joint as well. Um, neuromuscular control, inhibition and facilitation, how we can use our brain to work best with our muscles. And there are techniques you can use, and we're going to do some witchcraft type of stretching eventually, which you'll go, holy crap, how did that happen? Well, we're going to use neuromuscular control to inhibit muscles so that we can stretch them better. 
um, postural control, right? Sitting on this chair here, I've got a gamer style chair, right? This is probably not the best chair for me because uh, I can sit in it. I think it goes almost all the way back. I could take a nap if I wanted to in it. Um, but it's not good for postural control because it does all the control for me, right? Probably better would be for me to sitting on a physio ball or something like that to give myself a little bit of core training while I'm working here, right? Body mechanics. We're going to talk a little bit about body mechanics and how you should pick things up and how you shouldn't pick things up, right? You've always heard, or an air on chair, yeah, those chairs are beautiful, but yeah, no. I've got my uh, DX racer coming soon, so that's my next. That was one of the gifts from one of the companies I work for. Um, but where was it going again? Oh, lifting, right? We've all heard the story, lift with your legs, not with your back. Lift with your legs, not with your back. I'm going to tell you guys, if you are people that lift with your back and you're a PTA, you are eventually going to tear up your back and you won't have a long career. You've got to learn, and we're going to teach you different types of lifting techniques on how to best improve your overall function and body mechanics so that you can help yourself. But the same stuff you teach yourself, you got to teach your patients. A core stable, right? There's all kinds of things we can do for core stabilization, right? There's planking, there's this, there's that, there's rhythmic initiation, rhythmic stabilization. We can do with this. Uh, balance and agility, right? And with balance and agility, we also have some relaxation techniques. It's amazing if you ever watch, like I'm, I'm a huge, huge live PD junkie. I don't know if anyone else in here is going to ever admit that they're a huge live PD junkie. I'm a huge live PD junkie. Um, I especially love when they pull somebody over that's alcohol impaired. To me, it's just the funniest thing in the entire world to watch them pretend that they're not drunk. Um, but, you know, they have a set of exercises they're going to have you go through. And the funny thing is, is a lot of them, if they would just relax, they probably could get through those exercises better. But the goal of the officer is to get you off your game so you do fail the sobriety test, so that you will end up with charges against you, right? So some of those people, they just relax and kind of chill down a little bit. Um, there was a guy a few weeks ago on it where... They had him do all the, the walk in the line, standing on one foot. He touched his nose on either side, and then he blew a 0.16. You know, double the legal limit, but he looked completely normal. Why? Because he was just kind of chill. He was like, yeah, okay, I'll do this. Yeah, okay, I'll do this. And he probably was a functional drunk, too, but that's beside the point. So balance is big. Um, balance is another area that we've worked on heavily, and for those of you that have been in the martial arts, Balance is really integral to the martial arts training. Um, it's amazing how when I started in the martial arts way back, oh my God, 1981? Yeah, 1981. Um, when I started back then, how bad my balance was. And then as I got better, and what I found was the balance training I did translated to so much other stuff I did. When I started playing football, I found a lot of stuff I did in the martial arts transferred over to football. Right? There was transfer of training that went with that. So balance was big. Right? Breathing training. Um, this is big right now. We're doing a lot of this with patients in the hospital. Why do you think we're doing a lot of breathing training with patients in the hospital? Is there something that might be causing it? What do you think? Is there some reason? Yeah, smoking might be it, right? If there's a bigger problem right now that we're doing a lot of breathing. Yeah, corona, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of breathing training that you can do that will help you fight off corona, right? There are exercises we can teach patients that are completely COVID bound, where their lungs are filling up, that can help them overcome the corona. Um, Chris Cuomo, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, um, should be, I'm sure he's probably a comic, he's the, the brother of the uh, governor of New York, but he's also on CNN. When he came down with COVID, he actually brought in his physical therapist, who he has a physical therapist as a trainer. And the dude is jacked, if you haven't seen him outside of being on uh, the news. He's, he's a pretty ripped guy, but he has a PT that he works with every day. And that PT had to change his exercises and go to breathing exercises for him. And he was, was funny when he was going through his disease progression, he talked about how hard even just doing the breathing exercises were. I, I, I don't know to that, but I'm just going to, I'll defer to you on that one there, Erica. He's a, I just hope that half the time I, you know, I get to where his age is. I'm at least half as functional as he is. And then task specific functional training, right? Eventually, all of the exercises we're going to do are useless unless we can get them to apply what they're doing, right? 
and all of you observe somebody doing physical therapy at the clinics or something like that, and you saw they're doing, you know, long arc quads or doing wall walks with their shoulder, right? That's all great. Those exercises are great. But if it doesn't help them get back to packaging things for Amazon, it's useless, right? A soccer player that has an ACL reconstruction, we can do long arc quads, we can do muscle setting exercises, we can do terminal knee extensions, all those exercises. But if we don't eventually get them back to doing stuff like kicking the ball and dribbling the ball and doing cut drills, then we haven't really effectively trained them. So task specific is really important. And I tend to do a lot more task specific exercises with my patients. I find that if I can relate my exercises to something they normally do, they are more likely to do those exercises, right? Because they can see a reason why they're doing it. Safety is a big one though, right? We have to make sure we're not doing something that puts patient or puts ourselves in harm's way. I am living proof that when you're working with a patient, you have to be safe. You know, I, my, yeah, my neck that was fractured is from not being safe with a patient. I should have had assistance with me with a 500 pound patient. That's how my neck got broken was because I was outside of my own safety zone because in my hubris, I thought I can move anyone. Yeah, well, I found that out to be not true, right? So exercise safety is even big. Even if you're doing something as simple as sitting at the edge of the bed, you've got to have some safety there. Uh, classification system. You guys have talked about disability at least with, I know for PTA 110, and then you talked about it again in Dr. Sokel's uh, fundamentals of disease class, right? Remember when we're talking about the old style was the NAGI model, and we've kind of moved on now to the ICF model, which is more of a, an international classification of function, whereas the NAGI was a classification of disability. So you have to make sure when you go to your boards and you're getting ready for your testing, I always ask students, well, how much do I have to know about the NAGI model? We well, have to know that the NAGI model existed and it's no longer used. Don't focus on it, right? The NAGI model is our old model of classifying patients that have disabilities. We now focus on the ICF and we look at more of what their function is and less about what their disabilities are, right? But we do have to know when we're looking at these, it's a thing and now it's not, exactly. That's what you have to know about the NAGI. Done. Um, NAGI does cross over to the ICF model, but you do have to know that you have to know the ICF pretty, pretty inside and out, right? You have to know what the difference between an impairment in body function versus an impairment in body structure is, right? Or an impairment in body systems. What are activity limitations? What are participation limitations? What are some textual factors that can lead to these things? Um, let's, let's talk about maybe little old Millie. She's 65 years old and she's got a bad hip, right? Are there gonna be environmental factors that prevent her from maybe walking in her neighborhood? What do you think? So she's got a bad hip, she's got osteoporosis and it's starting to wear down where she's almost to the point of needing a hip replacement but she doesn't wanna get it, right? Yeah, right? There are, there's grass. Grass can be a huge environmental barrier. There are steps, there are curbs, right? There are some areas where, you know, it's inaccessible to people that have assistive devices. So all of that comes into play. There are also personal factors, right? We all have to have that motivation. You know, if I ask most of you, if you go to the gym, most of you are going to say, yeah, I go to the gym. And if I ask, are you going as much as you should? Then we're going to get, even myself, I'll say, probably not, probably not go, or especially not right now, um, but probably not exercising as much as I should. That's a personal factor, right? That's a motivational factor on my side. I, I don't know. I just don't find my need to be swole bro anymore. Um, so there's a personal factor that goes along with motivation is huge. If you don't key into your patient's motivational factors, they're not going to get better, right? If Millie likes going to Sam's Town to pull the one-armed bandit while she's sitting there and doing keno on top of it, well, then why can't we use that in her exercise program, right? Focus on getting her the ability to get back to doing those things that she really loves. Um, you know, for me, it was practice when I tore, I tore my ACL, my PCL, my LCL, my MCL back when I was playing football. My main thing really wasn't getting back to football. I was kind of at the end of my football career at that point in high school. What I really wanted to be able to still do was, ironically enough, skateboard. I was really big into skateboarding back then and still practice some martial arts. 
I had a really smart PT that said, well, let's, what do you do in the martial arts? Let's incorporate your martial arts into your training. Suddenly I actually did my PT. It's magic how that happened. Right? So talking about these different terms, right? Impairment and body function is problems associated with a body system, including physiological and psychological functions. So now we're going to look at Joe. Joe is a 47 year old um, guy. He works down at the casinos. Uh, he's actually one of the pit bosses. Actually, most of the patients we're gonna talk about have been patients of mine. I changed their names, obviously. But Joe has frozen shoulder. Joe's limited to 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. That's as much as he can use it. Can Joe still work with only 90 degrees of shoulder flexion on the left side? Yeah, he can, right? Is it limiting him though, maybe? Yeah, it's gone. It's going to limit him more in personal life than it is necessarily in his job. He always jokes that he really doesn't do much as a pit boss. He kind of stands there and, you know, looks menacing, he says. And I'm like, how can you look menacing? You're five foot one and 100 pounds. Um, but he's limited. So when we're talking about the impairment of body function, our system with that, at that point, we have to look what could be the impairment in that body function or system. Is it a musculoskeletal system problem or is it a neuromuscular problem? That's what we're looking at when we're looking at impairment of body function. Is it the musculoskeletal or is it the neuromuscular? And a lot of times when we have a patient with frozen shoulder, we'll work them to death with musculoskeletal and then ignore the neuromuscular. And in the long term, we find out they're not getting better, not getting better, not getting better. Suddenly we incorporate neuromuscular activity and they get better because we were working on the wrong function to start with. So this is what PT, this is why I'm actually happy that PTs have to deal with evals and stuff like that, because if they make the wrong choices on them, it's not on us, let them have it. Um, but we have to look at that, right? There are all kinds of systems that could happen. Could his cardiovascular system come into play with his shoulder and cause him problems with moving the shoulder? What do you think? Could that be one of the systems that could cause problems? anyone ever heard of thoracic outlet syndrome? Yeah, right? Thoracic outlet syndrome is a problem where the blood's not getting out to the arm. And if the blood's not getting out to the arm, then it's not a musculoskeletal problem, it's a cardiovascular problem, right? Maybe he's got a clot or a block somewhere in one of those arteries. Well, I can exercise him to death, but as long as that clot's still there, I can't fix them. So that's the impairment of body function. Impairment of body structure now looks at the anatomical features of the body. Right? So what structure, again, this patient's got frozen shoulder, what structure is impaired in that? What joint, let's go there. What joint is impaired, right? The shoulder, right? What's the technical term for the shoulder joint? Because we want it to be as technical as possible. What's the technical term for the shoulder? Glenohumeral, there we go, good. The GH joint, exactly. Right, so this, this impairment, so his impairment of body, and I'm gonna use him as an example again, Joe's patient I had, Joe's impairment was neuromuscular. He actually had a nerve pinch in his neck, right? So that was his impairment in body function. The impairment in body structure was both the neck where the impingement was happening, but also at the glenohumeral joint. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference between this body function versus body structure? Does that make sense? Because that's kind of the hardest one to get. Are we good there? Can you say it one more time real quick? Yeah, sure, no problem. That's why, I, that's why I make sure I cover that. So Joe again, frozen shoulder, his impairment in body system or function, you can, either of those are transferable terms. His impairment body system was the neuromuscular system. He had a pinch at C5, C6, if I remember correctly. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think it was C5, C6. So he had impingement up here, right? The system that was impaired was neuromuscular. The impairment of body structures was at the actual neck joint or the neck part where that impingement occurred, but also at the glenohumeral joint because his glenohumeral joint was limited. So that's kind of how we break those two down. Now, this is going to be in your eval. And again, this is taking it a little bit further than you guys normally would take it. But this is so you understand what a PT has to go through to get this. They have to figure out, they have to kind of tease them out and play follow the breadcrumbs. Now, activity limitations. Once we get past what we've got the system, when we've got the structures, now we see what he's limited. Eric, were you going to say something or you just pop up because you wanted to pop up? 
<laughs> yeah, so is um, body impairment function like the underlining issue and then the body structure is like the actual issue, like the, the physical? Yeah, you could, but I could also like, we weren't getting activity limitations. His main reason for coming into physical therapy was he couldn't wash his hair. So to him, that was his impairment. Had nothing to do with anything else. Even though, the, you know, we were talking about we had the function problem, we had the structure problem. He didn't care about that. His problem was he couldn't wash his hair, right? So it depends on where we're looking at. From our standpoint, absolutely, you're right. We're looking at the system-wise, we're looking at the structure-wise, and that one leads to the other. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Kind of sad he couldn't wash his hair. That, like, that made me sad. Well, it's because he's, so his thing was he was left-handed, right? So he predominantly, and so he said, it just feels weird when I wash my hair with my right hand. I, I thought people wash their hair with both hands, but what do I know? Evidently not. I don't have any. I'd shave with one hand, but, right? So it was really weird to him. So his activity, let's think of some activity limitations for him. Well, number one, we already had one. The, the one thing that drove him in here was he couldn't wash his hair. I don't, and he had such luxurious locks of hair. And I don't know why he, that was such a big problem to him. That was what brought him in, right? So he had an activity limitation, not being able to wash his hair. What other problems could he have been limited in? With the shoulder being frozen. Putting on shirts, reaching, dressing, putting on shoes was another one. Believe it or not, he, he had a problem because his arm just wouldn't function right and tying his shoes was a problem with them. Um, hugging his grandchild. Every time that is, because his grandchild would always run to him and he would pick him up into the air, you know, and do that oompa thing with the kid. We well, couldn't do that anymore. So that was another activity limitation for him. So our activity limitations are gonna limit eventually. So those are kind of the things we're gonna do. The activity limitations are the activities we do. Those activity limitations then are gonna limit it, go into participation restrictions. So, for example, let's just say he couldn't wash his hair. Is he going to go out as much on dates? You know, I don't know if it was a date or not, but is he going to go out as much on dates because he can't wash his hair? Probably not. But I mean, this is Las Vegas, maybe. Right? It could be, yeah. The, um, it, well, the, the thing is, here's the deal. Don't think that the shoulder is not our responsibility. Right? Now, participation-wise, absolutely, more of those ADL-type activities are their responsibility. Right, but the, the the big thing, the big misnomer we've had all these time is PT is lower body, OT is upper body. I look at it differently. I look, we are gross movement, they are fine movement, and even we still do some fine movement activities. Um, they're more on, you know. I always joke that PT is getting you from point A to point B, and OT is okay. I'm at point B. What do I do? How do I do it? Right. So that kind of comes into play, but I'm just using this patient because this is a good patient that kind of demonstrates all those areas that we go through. This patient could have been an OT as well, right? They could have just, they could have came to OT. It just happened to be that they got assigned to PT and that's where he was. Um, you'll find, especially in upper extremity clinics, like hand therapy clinics, the line between PT and OT is really blurry. And a lot of times what it comes down to is who has an opening on the schedule, right? A hand therapist can be a PT or an OT. And in essence, they're going to train the same stuff. Uh, it just depends upon, you know, especially like so the, the one the hand therapist I work with down in um, Tucson, you know, the, 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 it just depends on who's open. If there's a spot open on PT, that patient gets pumped to PT. If the problem is more dealing with ADLs, then usually they try to route them to OT, but we can still work ADLs. There's nothing that says we can't. Um, we work hand in hand with our OT partners. We really do. Um, so some of the other stuff, he wasn't, you know, wasn't going out as often as he was. So he was being restricted in his out type activities. Um, he also had a big old brodozer truck. And when I say brodozer, I hope you understand what I mean. Those are those, you know, lifted 44 inch wheels, never take them off road. They just look pretty type trucks. So he was limited in his driving because he couldn't get into his vehicle. Because again, left-handed was reaching up for the pull bar to get in, can't reach up there, and it's a little awkward kind of sliding your butt in that way into your truck. So he was limited in his participation, even driving his vehicle. So that was a participation limitation. Yep, exactly. I know a couple of PTAs that are OTAs as well. 
where they got their PTA license, they went back and got their OTA license so they could dual, kind of dual work. Um, it's not a bad idea, it's just I wouldn't want to do that. There's a lot more in OT that I don't, I don't want to have to help with. It's double the money, hopefully, right, you'd think. Um, I just don't want to deal with giving people showers. That, to me, it was never enjoyable. I've helped with that. It's not a lot of fun. But how do, what does that affect in their overall community, right? When we go back to Millie with maybe she likes to go down to the casinos. Well, if, she, if her arm can't pull down that band or she can't walk around the casinos, that's a participation restriction. And then we have those contextual factors, so things that make up some of the problems that go into this, right? Environmental is looking at the physical, social, and attitudinal environment which patients live, right? And personal is a lot of time have to do with their health state, including age, race, gender, lifestyle, right? And when we have those personal factors, a lot of time in those personal factors, we have modifiable factors and we have non-modifiable factors. Do you remember that from back in patho? Right? What would be an example of a non-modifiable factor for most patients? What can't we change about patients? Genetics, good, there's an excellent one, right? Age, I can't make them younger, right? I can't change that type of stuff. Um, even to, you know, to some extent, socioeconomic status. Some people will argue that socioeconomic status is a modifiable behavior, but it may not be, right? So you have to, that's a careful one to walk on. Modifiable, lifestyle behaviors are definitely modifiable behaviors. Smoking, right? It's amazing how much smoking, and I hope if you got nothing else out of Dr. Sokel's patho class, you realize smoking equals bad. Like smoking leads to every single disease under the book, pretty much, right? And that includes vaping because of the way nicotine reacts with the body, right? So all of that comes into play. So anything we can change is a modifiable behavior or a modifiable personal factor. Anything we can't change is non-modifiable. And there are some environmental factors too that are modifiable and non-modifiable, right? If you live in an apartment, there's some things that may not be able to be changed in that apartment, but you could always change apartments for the most part. So when we're working with a patient, look at their disability, we have to know their background, right? Let's say, you know, and a, a, another patient, or patient example here, um, Betty was her name, actually it was her name, but I don't remember what her last name is, I never, would never say that in the first place. Betty was a 96 year old woman who fell at home and fractured both her hips. 96 years old. I think Betty lived a pretty good life. And that she made it through a double hip surgery is no small feat, right? So she's, she's got a lot going for her. Um, after she came out of surgery, we had the PT had set some goals for her. And then the, the, the doctor of orthopedics saw me walking Betty and the most she could walk was 25 feet. That was as much as she could walk. And the doctor said, I'm not discharging her until she walks a thousand feet. Well, that's great. But what the doctor didn't know is Betty lives in a mobile home on the east side of town and she lives with her sister and her daughter. And in that mobile home, the farthest she ever has to walk is 15 feet. He didn't understand her background. The most she had ever walked in the past two years was 15 feet. And he's saying she's not gonna get discharged from the hospital until she walks a thousand. That's not knowing the background of your patient. Yeah, she doesn't walk that far, right? Exactly. So understand the background of your patient can come into play, right? Knowing your patients and knowing your own background can help too. If I've got a patient that has a martial arts background, I have a lot to relate with them on. If I have a patient that's a football player, I have a lot to relate to them on. And honestly, kids. Um, I don't know if you can look around me, um, but I, I, nothing against. I get along with kids because we're on about the same mental age. You know, and I play video games and we can talk about stuff like that. You know, when I was working with kids, I, I remember I had this one kid who was huge into the WWE. I have no idea about WWE. I learned it's a men's soap opera. Um, but what I did was I went home and I watched a bunch of WWE so I could understand when he was talking about Stone Cold or talking about John Cena. I knew he was talking about. Right. That was something I didn't have to do, but it helped me get the background of the kid I was working with. Knowing the background of your patients can be really important. Also knowing what they come from. If they don't walk a thousand feet, there's no sense in teaching them to walk a thousand feet. If they want to, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, knowing their health conditions. 
so on average, what do you think? How many comorbid? So comorbid means multiple conditions affecting the patient. On average, when you're working with a patient, how many comorbid conditions do you think the average PT patient has? Yeah, three. Believe it or not, three. You know, that can be diabetes, COPD, you know, fibromyalgia, lupus, anything that when they're comorbid, they kind of work together and cause bigger problems, right? So three is average. That means there are people out there that have zero, but that means there are also people out there with six and seven comorbid conditions. So that pathological condition, when you're working with your patient, oh, go away. I don't want to talk to you. Um, when you're working with your patients can be really important. We need to know what their health is like. And on top of that, pharmacological comes into play as well. The average American is on 3.7 medications, right? I love the 3.7 because somebody's taking 0.7 of a medication, right? You know, just about 10 years ago, the average person was on two medications. We're already doubling it. And, you know, I, I don't predict that to change, right? Because if you go to the doctor, the doctor says, here, have a pill, because there's a pill for this, there's a pill for that, right? Um, you know, you have, you, you're having anxiety, there's a pill for anxiety. Well, the anxiety now, pill now gave me depression. Well, how do we fix that? Well, we give you a pill for your depression. Well, now the anxiety pill, right, pills are easy. The anxiety pill and the depression pill has now made me gain weight. Well, guess what? There's probably a pill for that. So they get on all these medications, and that causes a pathological problem as well. So we have to be paying attention to that. And then looking at their pathophysiological conditions, how are things going to progress, right? If we have a patient that's got progressive MS, we have to know progressive means not going to get better. And telling a patient, oh, yeah, you know, in five years, you'll be great. Ugh, you got to watch it, right? We have a patient that's got a spinal cord injury. And we tell them, oh, yeah, I'm sure that in five, six years, you'll be walking. They're going to remember that. And they're going to remember you're the PT or PTA that said, five or six years, they're going to be walking. And in five or six years when they're not walking, they're going to harbor some resentment towards you. So you have to be paying attention to the way they progress as well. Um, so impairments, we talked about impairments of body function structure and everything like that, types of functional limitations. We kind of covered this all of, but as far as disability goes, this is something interesting. Is disability relative to the patient? What do you think? Or is disability just a disability? It's relative, right? So let's look, let's look at PT right now. Um, you're, a P, you're a physical therapist and all of a sudden you're out, I don't know, let's say you're riding mountain bikes or something like that and you fall down and you literally cut two of your fingers off. I don't know how you do it. You get stuck in the chain, you fall down, cut off two of your fingers, they can't repair them. So you're now down your pinky and your ring finger right? Can you still do PT? Could you still be a PTA? Yeah, you could, right? We could still function. Now, what if your job is playing trombone? Yeah, right? Now things are changed, right? Or you're a pianist. So disability is relative to the patient, right? It's very relative to their contextual factors. So we have to understand that, right? It's amazing how many people get this negative feeling disability because we've been trained and it's just beaten into us that when people are on disability, they're takers. I don't know if you guys, I mean, it, it's really, a and I, I don't want to generalize, but I will generalize in this case that traditional right wing style thought processes, if you're, disabil if you're on disability, you're a taker, right? Not necessarily, because their lives have been changed, changed forever if they're dis disabled. You know, I don't think always a person that goes on disability is automatically a malingerer and doesn't want, that just wants to be on disability for the rest of their life. My ex-wife was an excellent example. My ex-wife was training to get her DNP, her doctor in nursing professions, right? When she got really, really sick. She was already a nurse. She was training to become more of a nurse, I guess. I don't, I don't always understand what happens with nurses. But suddenly she couldn't work anymore. She wanted to still work. She still wanted to be a nurse. She still wanted it. And I'll tell you, when she, her income got cut out of our income, that hurt. Right? That really hurt our income. 
she didn't want to be on disability, right? She went on, you, you know, she went from making, you know, because she was working extra hours, we were getting probably a hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, depending upon how many hours she worked, because um, she worked in critical care, down to every month we would get seven hundred dollars from disability. That's a huge change. She didn't want that, right? But that's what happens sometimes when you get disabled. These problems happen, and then it creates all kinds of other problems. Now, are there risk factors we can avoid? Absolutely, right? And I'm sure you saw with patho, the number one time period for people to end up and avoid or to, to just ignore those risk factors are in our kind of dangerous years, right? I know a lot of them will say 18 to 25, but I think somewhere between 15 and 30 is kind of our dangerous years. That's where we have our most hold my beer moments, right? And that's usually whenever somebody says hold my beer, usually bad things are about to happen. So that's when you're like, nope, maybe not right? Hold my beer, I'm going to jump off this cliff. Hold my beer, I'm going to jump off the back of the boat. No, those are just setting yourself up and it's a risk factor for yourself, right? You got to be mitigating those risk factors just because you guys want to have long, healthy lives. You've got to be thinking about your own. So then how do we manage patients? Well, we've got to do clinical decision making, right? We got to make sure that we're treating them with the best possible method ever. And the best way we can do this is by using evidence-based practice or EBP. We used to, back when PT, you know, in the Stone Ages, when somebody came in for a total knee replacement, every total knee replacement was treated the same. And some clinics still do this. Some clinics still, a patient comes in with total knee replacement, they're treated the exact same as the next total knee replacement, as the next total knee replacement, as the next total knee replacement. That's not the best method. We've got to use evidence and use the best possible treatments for each patient and for their individual situations. And we're moving that way. You know, we're moving toward away from, you know, fee for service to more fee for outcomes, meaning that we're going to be reimbursed more if we have better outcomes with patients. I actually kind of like that model, right? And I know we're really fighting it here in the United States, but I worked under it in Denmark when I was there and it was amazing because the doctors, the nurses, everyone that was in healthcare we're incentivized to keep patients healthy, not just treat them when they're sick, right? In Denmark, you are required to have one physical therapy evaluation every year, whether you need it or not. You're to come in once a year, just like you're, you have your physical, and then you also have to go have a physical therapy evaluation, to determine if there's something that we can help in physical therapy to make your life better. Could we stop a lot of problems, maybe if we had that here? What if once a year you went to a PT? Yeah, right? Include that in your health insurance. No cost, just once a year you have a PT checkup. I guarantee everyone in here, if we do a full PT evaluation on your full body evaluation, we can find something you might need help with. Even myself, right? Flexibility, I've told you before, I'm not that flexible anymore. We don't value preventative care, right? We treat disease, we don't treat people. That's one of the downfalls of our education, right? Exactly, money's part of it. And it's not necessarily making money, it's saving as much money as possible, right? So that you, know, you don't have to treat patients as well, right? I mean, just look at some of the clinics and I won't name any names out there, but look at some of the clinics that treat five to 10 patients per therapist. It's not really good quality care, right? One of the things I loved about in Pennsylvania is one patient at a time. Right, you could have a maximum of two if those two patients were you know, contributory diseases, meaning maybe I had two total knee replacements. I could work on them together. And that's kind of important. I really like having one-on-one -on -one care with my patients. Why I love doing home health, because I'm with my patient, I have a direct impact on their lives. When I'm working with 15 patients, you know, one of the clinics I worked in here in town, I'll never forget one day, eight hours, I saw 70 patients. Eight hours, 70 patients. What kind of quality care did they receive? Did they receive any quality care from me? I felt guilty at the end because what I was doing was standing in the middle of the room and I was a circus conductor. 
I'm like, okay, yeah, you remember you, yeah, Sam, these exercises, remember we did these last week, you do those extra, and you, okay, this green strappy stretchy thing. I wasn't doing quality care with them, right? And I definitely wasn't doing evidence-based practice because that said that I wasn't treating them. And ironically enough, those patients stayed on in that clinic longer and longer because they didn't get quality care. The studies have shown that if they get more one-on-one -on -one care, even if it's only a small amount, even if it's 15 minutes a session of quality, one-on-one, -on -one, you are the only thing that matters to that clinician's life at that given 15-minute time period. Patients get better faster. Now you add in manual therapy to that and it, they get even better. So now not only are you seeing them one-on-one -on -one for 15 minutes working with them direct, but now doing manual therapy like stretching, massage, stuff like that, they get better. And massage therapists have this unlocked. They know that when they spend time with the patient and they spend one-on-one -on -one time with the patient, patients like the care and come back. Why don't we know that? I just don't understand it. But anyway, that's getting off topic. So patient, when the patient management model is kind of what we look at. They come in, they get an examination or an evaluation, right? So they come in and let, let's talk about the normal patient experience when they come to see a PT. What's the first thing the patients are greeted for by when they come in to see a PT? Absolutely, I have all that on education too, but that's beside the point, Kayla. I could go on to that. I could go on with education of smaller class sizes all day long. That's beside the point. So your patient comes in, the doctor refers them to McKeever's Physical Therapy Services. And if I'm just your traditional clinic, who do they encounter? The reception desk, good. Now, for those of you that work at the clinics, what's that reception desk like? Are they always the most pleasant people in the whole clinic? No. Oh. Well, Tyler's got something to say about that. I'm on my phone. Y'all hear me? I can hear you. Yep. Yeah, no, they're, they're definitely not always the kindest. Right. And they've got people screaming at them sometimes. And so the next person comes up and they walk up and like, hi, I'm here to see what? What do you want? Right. So now they've got already a kind of that bar that they've set kind of slinks down a little bit. Now, what's the next thing we do to them? What's the next thing we do? They see reception. What's the next thing they get? This is right before the reevaluation. Yeah. Here, here is a book. Go read it and sign it. And there's usually no instructions with those things, right? And I, the, some of those tests and measures can be really useful, but a lot of times the, when that first patient fills those out, they're useless because they have no idea what they're doing, right? Fill out 40 forms. Great. They fill out 40 forms. Now, those forms can be useful. We need a lot of them. We need stuff for insurance. I'm not saying that they're not useful. But now that bar is getting even lower, right? So now they come back for their eval. If you're a good clinic, eval's on time. But if you're a high volume clinic, a lot of times you're not on time. So now you're 10 minutes behind on bringing them back for their eval. Bar goes a little lower, right? Uh, I'm going to use myself as an example. When I had my broken neck, I was seen by an outpatient clinic here in town. I, same idea. Sat down. The lady at the front desk couldn't say my name, no matter how, I don't know how she couldn't say my name, but she could not pronounce Keith to save her life. It's really scary. Um, gave me a book to fill out. Filled out my book, sitting there. My eval was supposed to be at 11 o'clock. I got there at 10 to fill out all the paperwork. I was a good patient. 11 o'clock came. 11.30, 12, the front desk says, well, the PT is going to have lunch right now, so if you give them another 30 minutes, they'll see you. PT is going to have lunch right now. Great. Maybe I'd like lunch. Can they invite me back? Right? So then I finally get taken back to this clinic, and, you know, mind you, I'm wearing a full-on Philadelphia collar. Actually, I was wearing an Aspen collar at that point. And I go back and the PT says, so you're here because you have shoulder problems. I mean, yeah, I was having shoulder issues because my left arm was super weak, but it wasn't my problem. 
Now, mind you, I didn't tell them I was PTA. I wanted to get the full on patient experience. So starts doing an evaluation on me, spends, and I'm not joking, I timed it 13 and a half minutes with me for my evaluation on a spinal cord injury, 13 and a half minutes. And says, okay, well, you know, I'll be right back. I'm gonna send my associate back to do some stretching with you. So I'm thinking associate, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking PTA, especially if they're gonna come back and stretch spinal cord injury. Patient comes, or person comes back, hi, I'm, you know, Mary, I'm here to do some activities with you. Oh, where did you go to school? Oh, well, I go to school at Bishop Gorman. What's Bishop Gorman? High school. It's tech, 16. And she's going to stretch my neck. And on, oh, I don't know about rich kids school. I just know what Bishop Gorman is. Um, and she's going to do joint mobilizations with me on my neck. I'm going to go back to she's 16. And she's going to do all my exercise programs. So that whole time that I spent in their clinic, and I went for about 15 visits because it was required because of my work for comp that that was the only clinic I could go to. I, there's no restrictions on who can be attacked, Erica. There's not, it doesn't say you have to be 18. Right? It just says you have to be employable age. Hey, you go to Gorman, anything's possible. Isn't that where Snoop Dogg's kid went? I think it was. I mean, she was, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying she was stupid. That, that wasn't even going there. She was a slick cookie and she was doing what she was told to do. But still. Mm-mm. Right? So that's, a, that's the experience patients get. Right? Now let's change that. Right, a lot of clinics are starting to change that model. Um, I know some of the clinics, right? So now clinics try to get you your paperwork before you even show up at the building. Tell you what, can you go? Here's your paperwork, I'm gonna email it to you. Can you fill it out before you come in? Now that's on the patient if they don't do that. But now the patient doesn't have to spend 30 minutes in the lobby filling out paperwork because they can do it at home. What happens if that front desk person is a really nice person, just a generally good person, right? Come in, hey, how are you doing? Oh yeah, it's great that you're here today. You know, get signed in, we'll get you back in a few minutes. Now the PT's on time. PT's on time, spend some quality time. That whole process becomes better. And your overall patient quality scores are gonna be better too. And you guys are gonna find out really quick, your life is going to revolve around patient surveys. Your life is gonna be revolve. If any of you bought a car recently, or picked up a new car or anything like that at a dealership, I'm talking like, you know, you know, the regular like Chevy dealerships, Ford dealerships. Any of you? No? Aw. One of the things, I worked as cars, right? I worked, I worked as selling cars a long time ago in a land far, far away. One of the things we were judged on back then was that patient serve, uh, that client satisfaction survey, CSS, we got after we sold them a car, right? Well, you're going to have a CSS now as a PTA. They're going to judge you based upon, and their Medicare is going to start tying our reimbursement to our customer satisfaction scores, right? So the more we can treat a patient more like a human being and less like a number, the better our customer satisfaction scores are going to be. Um, but anyway, they're going to come in for the eval. Eval is going to be lengthy. Eval sh usually should be about an hour long. It's not something where they're coming in for a 15-minute eval, Right? We have to look at we're going to, have to look at the diagnosis process and the diagnostic category. Every patient is going to be classified by a number, right? And you may have heard this of an ICD. Have you guys heard ICD before? It's off of the ICF. Go figure, right? ICD is the International Classification of Disease. ICD is ICD-10 now, right? We were in the ICD-9s. Now we're in the ICD-10s. And what it kind of does is, if I'm a shoulder patient, there's an ICD for shoulder. There's an ICD for the left shoulder and the condition that I have. So every patient's going to have that. That's important. That's tied to reimbursement. My camera just keeps autofocusing. It's really driving me nuts. So they're going to have this diagnostic category. Now, when a patient comes in and they're being seen for a shoulder, and suddenly they say, oh, you know what, I've got a problem with my right hip too. Can we just automatically treat their right hip? 
No, right? We've got to do a totally separate eval for that right hip. And then we've got a total separate classification. And then we have to bill appropriately for each section. So that's why it gets a little more complicated when you have those kind of complex patients. PT is going to look at the prognosis and plan of care. And the main thing about plan of care is going to be our goals, because that's what we have to work towards. Our, our goal is to get patients to their goals set by the PT, right? And then once they reach a goal, we should be talking to the PT, communicating with the PT to set new goals. Because if we don't, we're not doing our job. So we've got those goals. We've got that planning. That's all the PT. The next step is where we come in. We come in on the intervention. We come in on treating the patient, right? That is our job. Our job is to get hands-on with patients as PTA. Our job is to make sure that we are making sure the patient is getting better. There still has to be coordination, communication, documentation. We have to work with our PTs, right? We have to coordinate with them on what's best for this patient, what's not good for this patient, what's working, what's not working. We have to document everything. Documentation is a pain. There's no other way of looking at it. Right? It takes up your life. Um, you know, there's a good meme out there that says, you know, this is what my family thinks I do as a PTA and it's massage, right? And this is what I went to school for and school showed me how to do is doing all these exercises. What I really do is spend time doing paperwork. It's true. PTs have it worse. Um, some of the insurances out there, they may have to fill out five different evaluations for the same patient. So it, it's just getting more and more document heavy. Uh, procedural interventions, patient-related instructions. we got to make sure the patient understands why they're doing what they're doing, right? They're going to have to have outcomes, and they have to be functional. They have to be getting back to what we want the patient to do. If we don't have functional outcomes, we're not doing it right. But we also have to have a way to measure those outcomes. We have to have a way that when they reach certain goals, are we giving them new goals? Or are we saying, okay, that goal is achieved. How many more of these goals do we have to achieve until we discharge them, right? Are PTAs involved with discharge planning? What do you think? Because you're all going to be a PTA eventually. Yeah, we're involved with it. Do we do the discharge eval? No. Yeah, there's the thing, right? Now, let's say we're getting a patient ready for discharge, and we have to have measurements of range of motion, measurements of strength, and we have to have them do three special tests we can actually absolutely do all of that. Get all the documentation the PT needs as long as the PT is the one who does the discharge. In a good clinic, they will work that way. In a good clinic for that discharge, that discharge session, the PTA will see them for the bulk of the session, getting all the information the PT needs. And then the PT will come in for that last 15 minutes of the session and just kind of close out their therapy with them. That's an ideal situation. Right? doesn't always happen that way. And I'll tell you, if you do that and you're that type of PTA for your therapist, they will love you. The more you can take off their shoulders, the more they're going to love you. And I actually just had one of the students contact me that's out in the clinics and they're amazed at how much work they actually have to do as a PTA. Like, this is a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not easy. You got a lot riding on your shoulders with patients' health. So how do we prepare them for exercise, right? Well, we need to prep them for exercise instruction. We need to understand conceptual motor learning. We're going to go through motor learning in another lesson. And then we have to get them adhering to the exercise. They have to do the exercises, not only in the clinic right, but they also have to do their home exercise right. So when we're doing a motor task, right, motor tasks are when we actually are doing some type of activity, some type of exercise. There's discrete, there's serial, and there's continuous tasks. A discrete, a discrete task is something you do once or twice and then it's done. A serial task is something that's going to lead to you doing something else, right? I like, so a discrete task might be scooting to the edge of the bed. That's a discrete task. A serial task would then be standing up where there are multiple steps going into that stand up so that it can lead you to walk. Where a continual task is the walking, right? The walking is going to have repetitive steps and repetitive things that occur. All of those come into play when we're working with the patient. Motor tasks are kind of the simplest form of exercises we're going to do. We're going to work with getting their motor units recruited. Then we have to think about the environments we work on them in. What would be an example of a closed environment? Or when I, if I say a closed environment, what do you think of? 
Okay, home could be a closed environment, right? A room. A room's a good example, right? A treatment room is a good example of a closed environment. Whereas many outside distractions are closed off and kind of block you off, right? My office could be a closed environment. I could even argue that with as much stuff as in here, I could argue that my office is an open environment too because there's books and monitors and TV up here in front of me. All that can kind of be a little bit distracting, right? Open environment is real life, right? For example, if I'm training you, you could even say closed environment is a clinic. If I'm training you to walk, the clinic can be a closed environment, but if I take you to a mall now to walk, that's a totally different environment. That is an open environment. There are things that are going to come at you that I can't replicate in the clinic. So closed environments where you can minimize distractions, open environment is where the distractions are all over the place and you can't account for it. We exist in an open world. We don't exist in a closed world, which means even if you are training a patient in a closed environment, eventually you should be moving towards a more open environment because they exist in an open world. What can we do? So inner trial variability in the environment. Are we gonna keep everything the same? Is it gonna be absent? Or are we gonna vary it, right? So let's say we are even in a clinic. So we're just in your regular average ordinary outpatient clinic. What can we change in the environment to make it more difficult for a patient to do their tasks? What's a simple thing we could do? So you're just in a regular old clinic. What's one thing you could do to change the environment that could change the way they do their activities? Yeah, turn on music. It's the simplest thing we can do. But that auditory change is a huge change to the environment. For certain people, that can be huge. Um, I'm gonna use myself again as an example. I, one of the clinics I worked in, they listened to hip hop all day, every day. And I have nothing wrong with hip hop. But there's something about the, the beat of hip hop that distracts me. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just I just want to get up and start shaking my booty. I don't know, right? But there's something about that beat that distracts me. And it really made it difficult for me to concentrate as a PTA. You know, now I could play heavy metal all day long and not get distracted because that's where I come from. That's my type of music I listen to or classical and it doesn't distract me. For some reason, hip hop just gets me to want to get out to the club. I don't know. Right? So that changes even for me. If that affects me, I can't imagine how it can affect the patient. Right? Um, I've had patients in cl that same clinic that came in and they hear hip hop on the radio and there may be, say, a 75-year-old lady or a 75-year-old guy. Not going to like it very much. Now you change it and you go back to where I come from back in Appalachia, right? And you put that same hip hop station on, you're going to have a different result with your patients. Totally and utterly different result. And some of that problem is what we're encountering now with all these protests and stuff like that, right? Totally different result. And they may not come back if you have that station on. So you have to be thinking about how we change the environment. We can also have them stop walking on the concrete surface and start walking on carpet. And change. Go from an, a, a standard bed to a low bed to change in the environment. Is the body stable or is the body in transport? Is the body moving or is the body just sitting there? Right, if I'm doing curls and I just sit here and I start doing curls, that's one thing. Now what happens if I keep doing those same curls but now I have to walk while I'm doing it? Does that make that task more difficult? Yeah, coordination comes into play, right? Even something as simple as asking them questions while they're doing it. You'll see those patients, right? They're sitting there, they're doing their exercises, and you're like, so how did you sleep last night? Oh, you know, last night was really good. No, keep doing your tasks. Oh, yeah, um, last night I slept really well, but at some point, you know, I woke up. People can't chew bubble gum and walk at the same time, right? It requires, and we'll be asking those questions on purpose because we want them to be able to do more tasks. We want them to be able to function in that open environment. And are they manipulating objects? Are they working with weights or are they not, right? Um, I love when OT does stuff like playing board games with patients or the big old Plinko board from um, The Price is Right. All that stuff, they're manipulating objects. If they're doing the checkbook while they're sitting there on a plyo ball working for their core, they're manipulating an object, that's a different task. So there's all kinds of things we can come into play to change things just by doing little things like that. 
this lesson, if you can get nothing out of this lesson, other than I rambled for however long many slides this is, this one's probably the most important thing you need to get. Because this is the stages of motor learning. You have to understand what each of these stages mean, right? So with these, you have a cognitive stage. So right now, you guys are, some of you are in the cognitive stage of motor learning for Therex, right? What that means is, in order to do stuff, you have to actively think about an activity, right? So if I asked you right now about an activity, a, an a exercise to strengthen the quads, right? First of all, you'd have to remember what the quads were. That'd be really important. You're like, oh, well, you know, if you lift the arm up here, no, that's not the quads, right? So you, you're going to have to cognitively think because you guys are still in that stage of cognition of going, oh, okay, the quads are the muscles in the front of the leg. Quads are responsible, you know, weak hip extensor or weak hip, yeah, flexor, and then also knee extensors. Okay, what can I do to do that? And then you have to think of an exercise, right? You're at that cognitive stage. Eventually, you'll move on to the associative stage, right? Now, when you move on to the associative stage is where you start coordinating what you're being asked to do with something in real life, right? Oh, well, you know, if we want to work the quads, we could always do stand-ups because that's what I do every day. And that helps work those quads. Great. You have associated something you're learning with an everyday task. The final stage is the autonomous stage. This is where it requires very little cerebral input to do something. I bet if I ask some of you when you're going to school, do you remember your drive into school? Some of you will say, don't remember it. Do you ever do that where you get up, you get in your car and you get to school and you're like, I don't remember how I got here, right? Or you just kind of get up in the morning, right? You can do most of your stuff around the house in the morning, very autonomous. You don't have to be thinking about it, right? Can you get in the shower without having to think of, okay, I must open my closet door to pull out towel. Now I pull out towel with my hand. After I pull out towel, I set it somewhere where I can access it. Now I will pull open door to shower. Now I will rotate the shower knob and turn it on. Can you imagine if you have to live in that stage, in that cognitive stage where you have to do that all the time? Well, guess what some patients do? And just the act of getting a shower is exhausting to them. But you guys can get up, hopefully you still are showering, I'm hoping, cross all my fingers, right? Hopefully you're still showering. Um, but you can do all your morning routine without thinking about it a lot of times. Now, let's say you're going to do your normal morning routine, but all of a sudden we have an eclipse outside and your power's out. So it is pitch black in your house and you have no candles, you have no flashlights, but you still have to go through your morning routine. Is that going to change the way you function? I'm guessing it probably would, right? What do you think you're going to look like when you pick an outfit out? Your routine's that totally out of whack, right? You're going to come to a school with green pants on and a fluorescent pink top or something. Like, I swear to God, I grabbed my uniform. Right? Everything kind of changes when a routine gets out of that autonomous stage, right? Or if you add a new task to your morning routine, right? Maybe now you start adding that you're going to run before you do your normal morning routine. For a little while, you'll end up back in that cognitive stage where your morning routine gets thrown out of whack and you have to get back into associating it with your everyday routine and then getting back to where it's autonom autonomic, where it just happens, right? Let's just think, what if we had to stay in the cognitive stage to breathe? If every time you needed to take a breath, you had to think of, okay, open our mouth, right? Or breathe in through through my nose, okay, so hold it for a few seconds and then I'm gonna slowly relax and let the air out, you know, all the air out. If every time you had to think about that, people would suffocate. Let's just face it. If we had to think to breathe, somebody would suffocate. They just would, they'd forget to breathe, right? If you had to think to pump your heart, if every time that heart needed to pump, you had to think about actually actively contracting, you can't do that, but actively contracting your heart, right? That's why your autonomic nervous system exists. It's there to manage those everyday tasks. Well, your everyday stuff's going to become that way eventually. 
Um, walking should be pretty autonomous for you guys right now, right? Going up and down stairs. That can be very autonomous until you miss a step. And then all of a sudden you're back in that cognitive stage because you get that feeling of, oh, oh, there's no step there. What do I do now? So when we're getting to the practice, we have to think about what type of area we're looking at. We look at those considerations on where we're going to practice the activities, right? And then we look at practice itself. All of what we're going to do, and this is funny, this is why we call physical therapy a practice. We are not a perfect, right? I love it when doctors call themselves, you know, a practice because that's literally what they're doing. Nothing a doctor ever does is perfect right? But we try to get better with time. Same thing with your patients. They're going to keep practicing until they're better with time. So part versus whole practice. Um, I know, I'm trying to think, um, one of you guys, I can't remember which one of you, but one of you does a lot of softball coaching. Can you break that softball practice down into parts rather than just practicing softball in general? I think it was at AJ that's, I don't know if it was AJ or who it was. One of you guys do that. Um, my brain's a little rusty right now. But you can break down each individual task into parts, right? Same thing with a patient. If we are going to work a sit to stand with a patient, our ultimate goal is just standing up, right? But there are individual parts to that stand up that we can work along the way, right? There's leaning way forward. That's one part, right? There's point of lightness where the back of your buttocks start picking up off the chair, right? And then there's hip extension, knee extension, which allows you to stand all the way up. That's different practice. Whereas we just work with just standing up, it's a whole practice. We can work each of those. We can literally spend with some patients, especially if they're a stroke patient, we may spend an hour with them just getting to the point of lightness. All right, good. Point of lightness. Okay, good. Nose over toes nose over toes. And we may spend an hour doing that with the patient because they have a cognitive disability where they're not understanding the whole. So we work on the part. Practice order. Do we work on a block order where everything is just kind of, this is what you're going to do, right? Flow sheets are an excellent example of that if you work in a clinic, right? If you have a flow sheet where the patient does exercises all day long, and they know that plan of exercises, they can get into a blocked practice where they can literally come in and almost do their exercises autonomously. I challenge that as PTAs, we should never have a patient that comes in and is able to do all their exercises without our help. If they're able to come in and do all of our exercise, all their exercises without our help, we're not challenging them. We should always have some activities that we're hands-on with that patient, right? Most patients like blocked practice, meaning they're going to do their exercises, they're going to do them in this order, and that's the way it's going to be. Most of you people that go to the gym have a block practice schedule. You know, you know, for myself, I know if I'm going in for arms day, I'm doing curls first, and then I'm doing tricep pull downs, right? Then I might do delts, and then I might go back to bicep curls, and then I go back to triceps. I have a set practice order I do. Right now, what happens when I get off the treadmill for my warm up and I walk over and the preacher bench is blocked? Now my practice has been thrown out. And now I'm in a random practice because now I have to find something else to do until I can go back to my order. This can be very dis disturbing for a patient. If you change it up and say, okay, well, no, today we're going to do the bad order. Today you're going to do this exercise, then this exercise, then this exercise. And that can really mess with some patients especially if they got a cognitive disorder like TBI or a stroke. So a lot of our strokes, we're going to work blocked. But in the real life, we don't work in a blocked order. We don't always function, and this is what we do every single day. Life throws us curveballs all day long, so we should be working a little bit of random and random blocked, where we may change things up and move them around, but it's to challenge them. Exercise. So what I want you guys to do right now is I want you to close your eyes for me. So, okay, my eyes are closed. We're going to work through standing up, but you're not going to stand up. You're going to imagine that you're sitting in a chair. When you're sitting in the chair, your feet are planted firmly on the ground in front of you. You can feel the ground 
It's concrete ground, you've earned bare feet. You can feel the coldness of that, that ground beneath your feet. You're in a chair that's got nice comfy arms. Those arms have a little bit of cushion to them. You can feel them resting against your arms. Now we're gonna work on standing up. So the first thing you're gonna do in your mind is I want you to put your palms on those nice comfortable arms. Once you put your palms on those nice comfortable arms, you're gonna shift your weight forward and slide your bottom forward in the chair, right? What I'm doing there is mental practice. I don't have to have a patient do anything and they can still get training from me cognitively, right? Because what I'm doing through is I'm having them run through in their mind what they're gonna do. That's different than actually physically doing it, but it can be just as useful. So make sure that if you're working the patient, you're not only challenging them physically, but you're also challenging them mentally. Feedback methods. Intrinsic feedback, where does intrinsic feedback come from? If I say something is intrinsic, it comes from within, right? Yeah, all of us are going to have intrinsic feedback. Extrinsic feedback is what we are going to give to the patient, right? Or augmented feedback, where we're providing them with external feedback source, right? They're going to know when they're standing up, and I keep using standing up as an example because it's a great idea. They're going to know if they mess something up because their body's going to tell them. But we also should be giving them an additional feedback, right? Knowledge of performance versus knowledge of results. That's when we're talking about, did they actually do the task well, or did they get to where they were supposed to be, right? And we're going to work both of our patients. And then providing them with feedback, we have to work on our timing schedule. We can't always give them feedback while they're working with it. If I have a TBI, so I've got a messed up brain right now. My brain is shaken up like eggs. It's scrambled. And you're having me do a sit to stand. And I'm in a very low level of TBI, meaning my brain is not working very well. I'm agitated, I'm confused. But you're having me work on just standing up, just standing up, pretty simple task. But the whole time you're having me stand up, you're constantly giving me feedback. Boom, 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 boom. You're firing off. Okay, don't forget, now your feet are on the floor, don't forget, now your feet are on the floor. If your feet aren't the floor, nice and flat, then okay, good, your feet are on the floor, nice and flat. Now push through those knees, push through those knees. That is a feedback overload, right? And I'm not going to like it, and especially if you have somebody that's agitated and confused, and that's going to end up with a bad day for you. They're going to get combative. So you have to understand the timing of your feedback and when you should give it and when you shouldn't, right? If your patient is agitated and confused, maybe dial back some of that feedback, right? Maybe give it at the end or at the beginning of a task, right? For you guys, we'll find when we start getting into activities, some of you will really hate when we interrupt you doing an exercise because you think you've got it down. I will say that I try not to interrupt you until you've finished whatever you're doing. So if you're working on doing exercises with one of your classmates, I try not to interrupt you unless it's a safety concern because I want you to finish the way you're doing it so that I can provide you with feedback on how to better do it. Right? Because I found in the past, if I interrupt somebody in the middle of doing an exercise, they get a little testy with me. I know what I'm doing. And, you know, again, I'm an LMT, or not L anymore, but I am a massage therapist as well. I found this mostly when I was doing the uh, massage class, that I would give some of the massage therapists feedback while they're doing their techniques. They look at me like, I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this for the past five years. Well, that's fantastic. You've been doing this for the past five years as a massage therapist. This is a different world. So you have to be open to receiving feedback and our patients have to be open to receiving feedback. You have to let them know, I'm going to be giving you feedback. I'm gonna let you know how you're doing. I find that the worst thing you can do is not talk to your patient and not provide them with feedback because then they start wondering if they're doing things right. right. Even your kids, those of you that have kids, right? Sometimes you provide them with too much feedback and they get a little agitated. Or sometimes you don't provide them with enough feedback and then they get into doing things that aren't right, right? Every parent knows that moment when they're sitting in the house and things are quiet, but it's not the good quiet. You know, the good quiet where everything's peaceful and calm and everyone's doing their thing. It's that bad quiet when you know there should be noises in the house and there's no noises. What's 
going on? Something's not happening. Then you go upstairs and your son or daughter is bathing the cat in the toilet. Right? Learners, right? For every learner, we learn differently. How many of you guys have heard before there are three types of learners? Have you heard that? What are the three types of learners? Okay, four. There's depends upon what you learn. What are the types of learners? Okay, hands-on, what's that type of learner called? Hands-on is kinesthetic, right? We have our visual learners, good. What's the other type of learner that are out there? Auditory, right? People that hear things. Um, I know for this type of class here where you don't get my direct interaction, I, I realized somebody actually messaged me that they prefer for me to keep my video on because they also get a visual feedback from me as well when I'm talking and they said that's much better for them, even if I'm doing nothing but talking a lot with my hands, which I have a tendency to do, right? It keeps them a little bit more focused than just hearing my voice. I'm open to that. Somebody, that was feedback I got from yesterday's class. My video was on always. I don't know why you'd want to see me, but hey, it's on. Um, but that, because there's a little bit of that visual feedback that goes along with it. Keep it good. Oh, hey, then it worked. Thank one of your classmates. Um, if I ever turn it off, because I don't want you guys to see me, I'm having a bad day. No, just kidding. Uh, but right now, the one thing we're missing is kinesthetic, right? And I'm still going to do some kinesthetic activities with you guys in this class. We're actually going to do still some exercises. Um, and I'm going to tell you, we're going to, it's going to be a little more challenging, but hopefully it can keep you guys, those of you that are more kinesthetic, learn still in, integrated into this class because we've got to keep you going forward when we're in this weird situation. Um, and I really think we're going to, I'm, I'm really worried because I'm just, I talked to one of the docs at the hospitals and COVID cases are going up right now, like way up. And who could have predicted that having a bunch of people together with protests is going to make the COVID cases go up. Who would have thunked it? Um, so the studies have shown though that we have those type of learners, but we're not you really a hard-coded one of those, right? I was not very much a kinesthetic learner. I've learned to be. You can learn to change your learning style. It's amazing. You can almost like learn, right? But as you learn, you're going to move through all those stages again. You're going to move through that cognitive stage. You're going to move through the associative stage. You're going to move into that autonomous stage. And that's kind of what you guys want to focus on is even with your patients, you need to understand how they learn. What happens if you have a primary Spanish only speaking patient and you don't speak Spanish? Is auditory learning going to help you very much there? Right? And I'll give this a hint, just so that you guys know this. Speaking slower and louder doesn't help if they don't understand you. I'm sure that all of you have seen that before, where somebody doesn't speak a language that you speak and they're like, standing up now. Doesn't help. <laughs> the problem's not what you're saying. I don't understand what you're saying, right? Uh, it just it amuses me when I see that that or the or the bad people are the ones that are like okay um, I don't know how to speak Spanish so I'm gonna say stando up oh Taco Bell that's not Spanish right it's not Spanish people right chili chanka no that's not helping them understand what you're doing visual now you're going to move into how you teach them to stand up showing them what you're doing, right? I've worked with patients that have spoke only Russian, Ukrainian, stuff like that, right, Selena? And they don't understand English at all. doesn't matter. I'm still able to get across what I need to because, number one, nowadays, all of us have a translator in our pocket, right? I highly recommend you keep Google Translate on your phones, even though it's not perfect. Sometimes it can give you really amusing results. Um, it does help with patients that have language barriers, right? But you can still show them. The, one of the things that I'll, you're going to hear a lot from me as we go through is STD. 
you are going to give your patients STDs and not in the way you're thinking, right? When I say STD, I mean show, tell, do, right? And that's, now that I've mentioned it, called it STD, you will never forget it. And it's funny, I still have the other class that are like, so I'm gonna give my patient STDs today. Good job, right? And they're called STIs now anyway, so we can use the term STD. What do I mean by show, tell, do? Right? So if you want a patient to do an activity, show them what you want them to do. I want you to do a curl. So we're going to go like this. Right? Going from that. Good. We have shown them what to do. Now, telling them can involve both speaking it, but it can also be getting hands on with the patients. So now I'm going to put my hand on them and move them through the motion I want them to do it. And the next phase is having the patient actually do the activity. So show, tell, do is a really important thing and it's a really way to help your patient cognitively understand what you want them to do. Even without a language, you know, commonality, if you show them what you want them to do, you kind of manually tell them what you want them to do, and then you have them do it, most patients are able to get it through, right? Working with kids, most of the kids I work with have language barriers, and it's usually not because they don't speak the same language I speak. It's usually because they're nonverbal. And what you'll find, especially when you're working with pediatrics, is it's no longer what you say, it's what you show. And there's a lot of sign language involved working with kids. So if you know a little bit of sign language, right, it can help you get across what you want with those kids. Um, so it's all important when we're doing it. So nothing else, give your patient STDs is what you learned from this lesson, right? What will cause patients to adhere or not to adhere to their exercise program? Well, patient-related factors. What's the number one reason patients will tell you that they didn't do their exercises? Okay, maybe. Yeah, there's the number one re excuse that we get, no time. What is the patient really telling you when they say that they have no time to do the exercises you gave them? What are they really saying? Maybe I forgot. Okay, I don't care enough. They couldn't relate. Those are some great examples, right? They have better things to do. All of those are ex excellent things to say, right? The other thing is maybe your exercises are too complex. For those of you that work in clinics, how many of you have ever seen a patient go home with an exercise sheet that has like 15 exercises on them. Do you ever see those home exercise programs? I want you to do all of these three times a day, 15 reps each. And the patients are like, huh? At most, when you send an HEP home, it should be three exercises. If I give you three exercises and I want you to do them two times a day, 10 reps each, Patients will do them. It's really important when we get into pelvic health, right? We're gonna take a trip down an exercise right now because I don't have hands on with you guys. So we're, I'm going to teach you and, and we'll see tomorrow how many of you guys can follow my exercise program. I want you to do three exercises for me by tomorrow, okay? I want you to do them twice between now and tomorrow or between now and Monday. Forgot, we're not having class tomorrow, my bad. I forgot we started in midweek. I usually do this, you know, Mondays. This is now Thursday. So what I want you to do for the next couple days now, we're going to add it and we'll see how adherent you are. We're going to strengthen our pelvic floor. Where's your pelvic floor at? Yeah, good. it's in your pelvis. It's amazing, right? What's your pelvic floor responsible for? Urinary continence. Are you able to actually hold your urine, also hold your fecal matter in as well, poop, right? People have problems with that. So we're gonna have fun today because we're gonna do an exercise. So I'm gonna teach you the basics of a Kegel or a Kegel or, a, or if you come back from where I'm from, those Kegels, right? Okay, so now I've got to think because I've got Men, women, and whatever else you want to classify yourself. You classify yourself as a tree, then find your tree. 
I don't want to include if you're not if you're a tree if you, I don't use your classification I apologize I'm usually going to deal deal with the binary system of man and women and I'm going to do with chromosomatically if you're a man or a woman not necessarily what you are you can do them anywhere exactly right so this is why it's great that you can do this again we're going to do two of two sets ten reps each I'm going to give you three exercises. All three exercises are the same exercise. So what I want you to do right now is you're gonna get the idea of how to do a Kegel. What I want you to do is I want you to focus on thinking about everything below your stomach. So your stomach actually rests on your pelvic floor. So all this stuff down here pushes down onto your bladder and down in there lays a sling called the pelvic floor. And we're going to do an exercise. So what I want you to do is I want you to contract your pelvic floor like you are trying to hold in passing gas or stopping yourself from going poop. What you should feel if you were a male is you should feel the base of your penis and your testicles kind of contract up and in. If you're a female, you should feel those outer lips of your labia close slightly. You'll feel a slight closing effect. You're gonna do that and you're gonna hold for five seconds. I'm doing one right now and you can't even tell it. Three, four, five, and you're going to release it. That's how hard the exercise is. I want you to do those in seated, in standing, and lying down. So you're going to do a total of 60 repetitions for the day between now and Monday. Now, can, how many of you guys could say, I don't have the ability to do those? I don't have time to do them. What do you think? Do you have time to do those? I just did five of them just sitting here talking to you guys. So yeah, you can still do them even when you're doing stuff like that. My exercise is simple, right? It's something you can accomplish. Now what could make it better is if I could give you a diagram, but I don't know that a diagram of doing a Kegel is actually going to be very beneficial. I'm just saying, right? But if I can give you a picture of doing exercises, it really helps out, right? Getting hands on also helps. Even in this case, when we're working with urinary patients or urinary, you know, urinary incontinence patients, getting hands on with them actually is truthful. We're going to have a whole class on that when we get to fifth semester, where we're going to talk about working with patients and how you can palpate to tell if you're, the patient is doing Kegels properly, right? There are a couple different types of palpations. There's external palpation. There's internal palpation. And let your minds wander until fifth semester. Um, and I've worked in, I've, it's primarily a women's health field. I've worked in women's health. I covered for a women's health therapist for a week and that was an experience. I'm just gonna say it. But what I found is people that needed help with this didn't care if you're a man or a woman, they just wanna get better. And it was amazing is that when I did pelvic floor work with patients, they are the most compliant patients ever. Why? Because their exercises are really, really simple and they see a result from them. It's amazing how that works. Give them simple exercises, they see a result from it, they get better. So what makes an exercise compliant? Well, again, getting them motivated to do what you want them to do, right? So I need to give you motivation. If you complete these exercises, 20 reps, three different exercises, standing, seated, and supine, and you perform them every day until Monday, I will give you 10 points towards homework. Now, have I given you motivation? Yeah, right? So how do we motivate patients? Well, that's what we gotta figure out. We gotta figure out what motivates them, right? What if their motivation is not to get back to work and we're constantly talking about getting them back to work? Do you think that's going to help them? We got to get you back to work. We got to get you back to work. And the patient's going, I don't want to go back to work. It doesn't help, right? We need to find what motivates them, right? We'll go back to my guy with the shoulder issue. One of the biggest motivations he had was he wanted to lift his grandson. So guess who I brought to therapy? I had him bring to therapy with him his grandson, bring him with you next time. We'll integrate him into your exercises. Yes, it's 10 points towards homework real. Yes, I'm giving you your motivation to do exercises. 
This is kind of a learning process and we'll see, and we'll see how many people are honest about it. I'm not going to, I'm sure everyone's going to say they're going to do it. And this is a real life situation where I have to trust that you did it. In the therapy world, how would I know you did it is by have you progressed or have you regressed? Right? I'm going to test you. One of the things I'm going to test you guys on on Monday to see if you guys actually did them is you're going to instruct me on how to do it. Right? You guys, one of you guys is going to walk me through it and tell me how to do it. And this is a little bit of playing phone tree too, because I want to see how it comes out. So we have to get them to adhere to an exercise program. Factors that relate to their health condition can cause problems. If they're out of medication, that can cause them to not adhere to the exercise program. If they need their Parkinson's meds in order to function and they are, and don't have access to Parkinson's meds, it's a problem. One of the major problems we're running into right now with patients is patients are not able to get hydroxychloroquine. What type of patients take hydroxychloroquine? Malaria, good, that's one of them. You usually don't see those in PT too often though. Lupus, it is a disease modifying drug for lupus. And what it does is it tamps down the immune system so that they're able to function. Sadly, in this area right now, we have a shortage of hydroxychloroquine. Why? Why do we have a shortage of hydroxychloroquine? COVID, right? Why? Because orange man say take hydroxychloroquine. When we know, and this is by study after study, guess what hydroxychloroquine does to COVID? Nothing. In actual reality, we've shown it actually causes problems to people that have COVID. It does cause them heart attacks. The main thing it causes is fatal arrhythmias, right? None of you guys want to have a fatal arrhythmia where your heart's beating when it shouldn't be beating, right? Or not beating when it should be beating. But now think about it. Because we've had somebody push a drug that wasn't tested for disease that it's not meant for, we've got patients who need the drug that can't get it. Now, if I have a lupus patient, I tell them I need them to do these exercises at home and they can't get their medication to kind of calm down their disease, they may not be as adherent to their exercise program. So I may have to change exercises and make them easier for the time being. That's how this stuff comes into play. Um, program related variables, just kind of what we're working with them. There's all kinds of strategies to foster adherence. I'm gonna tell you all of my years working in the adult field with physical therapy, one of the best motivators I find are kids. I use kids to my best advantage. Not only do I treat them, but I also like using them in my therapy because I like having little Johnny coming in with grandma because I'll look at grandma, did you do your exercises? And she's like, yeah, I did. And guess what little Johnny will say? No, she didn't. She hasn't exercised since the last time I saw it, you saw her. They're great little snitches, right? They're also really eager into helping family members until they get to teen years and then I can't help you. Um, then they, they're just, you know, on their phone, right? But it's amazing how much kids want to help their parents and their grandparents get better. Use them. There's all kinds of things you can do by getting them involved in the therapy that'll help, right? Giving them easy exercises fosters adherence. Giving them exercises that apply to what they're doing fosters adherence. Anything along those lines can help make sure they adhere to it. So let's look at prevention, health, and wellness, right? Healthy People 2020 was the old kind of model that we worked on before, which was working on getting people healthy by 2020. I think we failed. Just saying. Right? Healthy People 2020 was this vision where we looked at, can we get a move from a disease model to a prevention model by 2020? Did we ever achieve that? No, we're still exactly where we were. Right, so Healthy 2020, bye-bye. So these are the goals of Healthy People 2020 that was in your book. I'm going by them because we failed at it. So we need to start looking at Healthy People 3030, I think at this point, right? So some key terms when we're talking about health and wellness. Health is the general physical, mental, and spiritual condition of the body. Notice there are three key pillars to that, right? There's the physical component, there's the mental component, I don't have a third arm. 
and the spiritual component. You don't need to know Healthy People 2020. That's why I moved on by it. It's in the book. You won't get a question on it because we failed. That was, a, that was a test problem that we failed, right? But health is important. If I'm missing one of those three arms of health, I may not be healthy. Can I be perfectly fit, just in just ripped and jacked up and not be healthy? Oh yeah, right? If you ever need an example of that, go into an NCAA football locker room. You know, I've worked on sidelines in some football teams and a lot of these guys, not only some of the guys are not healthy to begin with, but a lot of the guys that are ripped and shredded, you know, are taking stuff to get themselves ripped and shredded and their mental status is gone, right? Um, what was that? There was the movie a while back about college programs. Called, oh, it's called The Program. That's right. You ever want to see one of what happens to people that are in college programs? That's kind of terrifying, right? But one key thing I say there is spiritual condition, because you guys will get from me that I am not a religious person. I don't believe in religion. I never have. I do believe we do have to have a little bit of spiritualism to our own minds, right? There, we do have to stay in contact with everything around us in order to function. There has to be a little bit of that spiritual. So for some people, that spiritual connection is religion. For me, it's not right. But there still has to be that pillar holding us up. So all those have to be there. A wellness is a state of good health often achieved through healthy lifestyle choices. If I go and get McDonald's for lunch, does that make me not healthy? No, it may not, right? Does it mean I made an unhealthy choice though? Yeah, right? Even if I go to McDonald's and pick up one of their salads, I don't know if you've ever seen the ingredients for their salads, not exactly the healthiest things in the world, right? Um, Wendy's is a great example of it, their taco salad. Like if you ever looked at, or, or better yet is, um, what's the Chipotle, right? If you ever look at the calorie counts and food counts on a lot of their meals, you would think, well, I'm eating healthier. Not really, right? I, you can make an unhealthy choice. You can still be a healthy person as long as you overall live a healthy lifestyle, right? And health promotion is the big thing we need to be on is contributing to the growth and development of health. We can lead, um, we can lead a horse to water. We can't force them to drink. We can lead our patients to a healthy lifestyle. doesn't mean they're going to do it, right? But if we at least lead them in the right direction, we've succeeded a little bit, right? So that's the main thing there. Health-related quality of life is a total effect of the individual's environmental factors and the function of health. Fitness and physical activity. Does fitness, physical activity lead to a healthier life? What do you think? Yeah, most times it does, right? Just moving, right? Motion is lotion for the body. The more you move, the better you will feel. Even if you are in pain, the more you move, the better you'll feel, right? Just sitting here for this period of time is driving me nuts. As you can see, I'm shifting around and kind of bouncing because I'm the type of person that usually when I'm teaching, I'm pacing. So this is a new world for me. And pacing in this office would be a little weird. Um, so movement is key to making sure the patients get healthy. Even if it's nothing more than walking, changing a behavior from being a sedentary person to even just walking is a huge improvement in their physical quality of life. So that's one thing we need to understand, right? So screening, providing education, intervention, even though this is part of the Healthy People 2020, this is still something we're doing in physical therapy, right? We can still screen people for physical therapy and see if they need it. Even as PTAs, a lot of times, and it's going to come happen, you guys are going to get to kind of go through it, and hopefully we do it this year. We didn't do it last year. But amazingly, in October, October is falls month. Gee, I wonder why October is falls month, right? Because it's in the fall. And a lot of the clinics will get together and we'll have a fall screening class for older folk where they come in and they get a free screening of their overall balance and health. 
And what the job is for us, and we can go and we can screen these older folks and see if physical therapy might help them keep them as healthier because maybe help their balance and keep them from falling as much. The greatest predictor of future activity is past activity. So if a patient has fallen in the past year, there's a good chance they're going to fall again. If a patient has exercised in the past year, there's a good chance we can get them back to exercising again. Breaking bad habits is kind of the hardest thing we can do for patients, right? If they've lived a sedentary lifestyle for the last 40 years, getting them to go to the gym five times a week is probably a stretch, right? Provide expertise and knowledge. We all do that. Even though you guys won't feel like an expert, you're an expert to your patient. Remember that, right? You're, you are an expert when it comes to getting them better, even if you don't feel like it. You're much more of an expert than they are. And you're much more of an expert than WebMD or their friend on Facebook that told them stuff, right? That's kind of our job. And then looking at how we can contribute to research, what do we need to research? I don't know if you guys are interested in research. I'm personally not. I just don't like the, the length and stuff that goes along with research. But I know there are things we need to research, right? Do you think we need to research how we keep ending up with these really, really, really kind of Serious, severe pathogens that are happening nowadays and they seem to be getting worse, right? Think about it. We had swine flu, we had avian flu, and now we've got COVID. And specifically COVID-19 because it happened in 2019, but we'll have a COVID-20, COVID-2021, COVID-2022. It'll keep happening. But should some research probably going into why we keep having these serious diseases? What do you think? What do you think is causing us to have all these diseases? What are some factors that might cause it? You guys still awake? Eating weird things. Okay, good. But why is it weird? So let me ask you, is eating snake weird? Right? Yeah, where I'm from, guess what? Where I'm from, eating snakes is normal. Tastes like chicken. If you go down to Louisiana, you might end up getting some croc or some gator. Right? So just because it's eating, because, you know, for like for us, we know that COVID happened from bats. But believe it or not, bats are really lean meat. And they taste like chicken. Of course, everything tastes like chicken. What if chicken didn't taste like chicken? What if we're wrong? And chicken actually tastes like alien or something like that. Maybe we've gotten this wrong the whole time. But eating weird is relative to the person, right? Everyone's normal. But definitely hygiene comes into play, right? What about the environmental contextual factors? Is living in LA healthier now than it was in the early 90s? Nah, a little bit. The, the smog was a lot worse in the earlier 90s. Rocky Mountain Oysters. <laughs> yeah, let them Google that. Um, but yeah, so eating weird things can be relative, but cooking them and preparing them properly can be the big thing, right? What about steak? How many of you guys love your steak? You know, you, it better be mooing when it comes to you on the plate. Right? Guess what you do every time you do that? You open yourself to foodborne pathogens. You do. I'm not saying that it's wrong because I openly admit that I tend to eat a little bit raw meat, right? But it opens you up to foodborne pathogens. So there's all kinds of things that lead to this. What about our abuse of antibiotics? Have we traditionally abused antibiotics? Yeah, absolutely. When I grew up back in the Stone Ages, you went to the doctor and you had a cold. Literally, you went from the doctor's little waiting room or the treatment room, you went out and you saw mama at the front desk and mama was the uh, pharmacist because they had a little pharmacy in the back. And usually you went in for a cold and they gave you 15 penicillin and sent you home. We now know that penicillin did nothing for that cold. All it did is made us more 
you know, made the viruses more resilient to the penicillins. And now we need stuff like amphicillin, right? Um, all the erythromycins and all those in order to fight simple bacteria. And we've created this stuff called MRSA, right? And VRSA. We've created these drugs that are now resistant to the penicillin strain. So there's a lot of stuff that leads us to these diseases, right? But there needs to be research into it. Hydroxychloroquine is an excellent example. Just telling people to take hydroxychloroquine because the president says so, I, yeah, I could go on that for hours. But that is like, you know, telling you, telling your best friend who is a farmer telling you to put orange juice in your gas tank because he read it somewhere helps. The president is not a medical expert, right? Unless he's a doctor. And then maybe saying take medicine is good. But then I, I guarantee if we had a doctor and his president, be a little more careful about recommending medications, right? That's kind of where we are right now. We gotta make sure that when we're doing stuff, it's viable. Why are you doing these exercises with a patient? Because the, the evidence shows this. Why do I teach you in a certain way? Because the Evidence and the research shows that if I teach you in this certain way, there's a better chance of retention. Primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Did you guys get this in patho? Because this is an important concept that you will have to know for your boards. Did she talk about this in patho? A bit. Okay. Let's cover it just real quick. Right? Primary prevention is the prevention of a target problem or condition. So let's talk, let's talk diabetes too. Diabetes, diabetes, diabetes too. A primary prevention for diabetes too is a proper diet and exercise. That will help prevent you from getting the disease, right? So primary prevention is working on preventing you from developing a disease. Secondary prevention decreases the, the duration and or severity of the disease. So what would be something that would be, we well, could actually consider diet in the secondary prevention once you have diabetes. Monitoring glucose levels, excellent, great idea, right? Taking your diabetes medications, right? And then tertiary preventions, now we're talking about decreasing the overall disability with chronic irreversible diseases. Now, once you've got diabetes, how can we prevent you from developing all the other conditions that come along with it, right? Because diabetes is a slow downward slope. Some people it's actually like a cliff, um, but for the most part, it's a slow downward slope. So all of those come, exercise falls into all of those, doesn't it? It could be a primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention, right? Well, let's say a patient doesn't have a disease. Well, we're going to do primary prevention to keep them from getting it. Once they get the disease or diagnosed with it, we're going to try to prevent them from getting worse. And then once it becomes a chronic condition, we try to stop it from having as great of an effect on the patient. ALS. What is ALS? Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Good. Right? Lou Gehrig one day woke up and somebody said, there's a disease that's got your name on it. And sure enough, there it was. What happens in ALS? Do you guys remember that from patho? Muscle stop working, exactly, right? And it goes from distal, the outer extremities, into proximal. So you start losing all of your distal musculature first until you get in where you're kind of locked into your core. And then eventually that'll start failing too, right? ALS, you'll eventually probably die of respiratory complications. Is there a primary prevention for ALS? No, because we don't even know what causes it. We have no way of preventing it other than, you know, we know that there's a higher correlation to working in a nuclear facility to getting ALS. So I guess don't work in a nuclear plant. There's a primary prevention. Um, but other than that, we don't know any primary prevention for ALS. Secondary prevention. When they are first diagnosed, yeah, we can start doing some stuff, exercise to keep them functional, right? 
ALS eventually is gonna move into that tertiary prevention where we start helping and keeping them from getting worse. But unfortunately with ALS, they're eventually gonna die. There's no way to stop it at this point. Now we may come up with something tomorrow that could stop ALS. But primarily with ALS, the main thing we're gonna be focused on is tertiary prevention. Uh, identifying risk factors, pre cessation screening risk assessments are always good. Determining the readiness to change for a patient. There's all kinds of theories on this, right? So we have the social cognitive theory, the health behavior, belief model and trans theoretical model. Great. Again, these are in there for FYI, please. I'm gonna write on that. F Y I. Don't get caught up in these. But the main thing for change is motivation, right? You have to have the motivation and the ability to self-efficacy to monitor yourself and actually initiate change. I applaud you all because you all made a change in your life, right? You came to PTA school. Now, some of you came because you wanted to make more money. I hope a lot of you came because you have an altruistic goal of getting people better. Because, you know, if you want to make more money, you can make more money. You're not going to be rich being a PTA. You're not going to be rich being a PT either, sadly. I tell you that. Sometimes we're richer than them because they have all the student loans. But, you know, you guys made a change in your life for the better, hopefully, as long as you do everything you need to do and pass your boards, right? Was it hard for some of you guys to make that change and come to PTA school? Is it still hard for some of you? Not really, okay. Erica, yeah, right, it is. It was difficult for me. Um, you know, especially going from the IT field to the PT field, that's a big change. So I know some of you guys, you know, some of you come from being a chef. I used to cook, I was never a chef, I was never cool like that, right? But I spent many years managing restaurants too because I found out that a management field kind of transverses all fields. You can manage whatever you want if you're a good manager. Um, but that's a big field difference compared to here. Some of you have worked in banking. Some of you may have worked as tech. It's not as big of a jump, right? But you've all made a change for the better. The reason you made your change is because you had the motivation to. Maybe you needed more money. Maybe your life just wasn't going the way you wanted to. There's all kinds of reasons for a change, but you know, if you don't have the motivation to change, you never will, right? Even if we can take that a step further and look at the, the current you know, criminal prosecution model that we have in this country, why do we have such a high recidivism for criminals that commit crimes and go to jail? Why do so many of them go back to jail? Because there's no motivation for them to change, right? They go to jail, they come out of jail, they have no prospects, they have no ability to get work, you know, they've lost most of their rights, they don't get to vote, they don't get this, they don't get that. So they come out a second rate citizen and the only way they may be able to survive is going back to the field that they, you know, the criminal career they knew before. Look at a lot of different countries that look at that where their jails aren't like our jails. They give people the motivation to get better. It's kind of amazing how that happens. So develop a program, we assess the need, set some goals and objectives, develop the intervention, implement and evaluate the program. This is what you guys all did. You assess the need. Do you need to go back to school? Yes or no, right? You set your goals. I wanna become a PTA. Some of you are just using this as a stepping stone to become a PT, or you have the idea to become a PT. I'm gonna tell you it is possible to go from a PTA to a PT, but it is hard work. If this school is challenging to you, PT school is 10 times as hard. And I'm only gonna say this, I failed out of PT school. So if that doesn't terrify you a little bit about what PT school's like, I don't tell you, right? But maybe your goal is to become PT, great. I'm never gonna dissuade you from it. Go become a PT, become my boss, and, let, and then let me manage you. Develop the intervention, your intervention is now going to school, right? Implement the program, we're doing that, and evaluate the program, you'll eventually get evaluated because you have to take your test. All right, so stop scare, share there. How's everyone surviving? Is there anyone fried yet? Need a snack? 
All right, well, it's 10.46. I'm supposed to go to 12.30. Why don't we take a 15-minute break, come back at around 11, and then I'll start the next lecture. I'll probably let you guys out early today because it's the first real day of this class. So let's take a 15-minute break. Sound good? Take a 15 minutes, go to the bathroom, stretch, do some exercises, and I'll pause the recording. So we're going to start with talking about the next kind of lecture we're going to talk about, which is how we deal with patient supervision, right? What do we have to do as PTAs to manage our patients? Um, like I said, I sent you guys a pretty cool link. I hope you guys check that out. Physio of Mains is hilarious. Uh, one of my other clinicians just sent me that, so I was laughing at it while I was sitting here. So please enjoy looking at that. Um, but this is talking about how we manage patients. Now, I pulled most of this out of the Fundamental Orthopedic Management book, which is a desk copy at school. Um, so this isn't something you have to study for. I pulled what I needed out of the book for this lesson, because there's not really a good lesson for this out of your Therax book. So I'm talking about how we kind of, how we problem solve with our patients, identify and discuss rationale for patients, discuss our skills needed for patient supervision, is to talk about objective measurements, blah, blah, blah. So let's look at the terms we need to know. We all have these accountability tools that we need to be held accountable for, right? Most of our accountability is gonna be held by the insurance carriers that we work for. Are we making our patients better, right? But all of these kind of words here are gonna come into play and we're gonna talk through these. I'm not gonna read through all of them, but we're gonna talk about kind of all of them as we go through. So supervising the patient during treatment. Whether you guys like it or not, whether you want to be or not, you guys are going to become supervisors. Yay, I have a leadership role. I lead patients. You're supervising the patient during their interventions. There shouldn't, again, I said this before, there shouldn't be a time where a patient's able to do everything themselves. Um, I'll be honest, if I come to your clinical site and I see you sitting over in the corner and the patients are overworking by themselves and you're like, oh, I had this. I went to visit one of the students that was on a clinical affiliation. And student was like, oh, they can do all their exercises by themselves. That's not skilled treatment. If they can do their exercises by themselves, the whole therapy program, we're not providing them with skilled therapy. And an insurance carrier can reject that if there's not some form of a reason why they're doing it all by themselves. And I, I really think a revolution is going to come in therapy where they're going to start rejecting these patients that are doing all their work themselves. It's only gonna take one good lawsuit from a patient to do that and things are gonna to have to change. You have to have effective problem solving solutions and the ability to make good decisions. You will have to have interpersonal communication skills, meaning you communicate between people, uh, paper, patient supervision methods, data collection skills. This is something that will develop over your time. I guarantee this will be something that takes you a little bit at first, but as you get better at it and better at it and better at it, it will take you less time and less time and less time. Um, I remember when I first came out as a PTA, I used to have to document, like I used to have to keep a little notepad with me and document everything I did with every single patient. Because by the time I got to document at the end of the night, I forgot what I did. Nowadays, I'm a little bit better at it and I can kind of keep it up here, but I'm starting to get to the point now where I'm actually have to go back to that document because I'm starting to lose my uh, remembrance skills there a bit. Uh, problem solving abilities and how to respond to clinical decision making, right? So the purpose of clinical patient supervision. Well, we have to gather the relevant data. We establish and enhance rapport. What is rapport? When I say rapport, what does that mean to you? Should I establish rapport with you guys? Yeah, it's a relationship, right? It's that that give and take between the people, right? Rapport doesn't mean the patient has to like me. Doesn't mean I have to like the patient. It just means can we communicate and get through what we need to do, right? I'm sure some of you have maybe even been in relationships before where you can get through it, but you may not like each other, right? There's a rapport there. Maybe not the best rapport, right? Some trust, the patient has to trust you. And what's going to, be, again, lead to them trusting you more is whether they've had a positive experience in PT before or not. It's really big in the psych field is if they've had a negative psychological experience with a psychiatrist or a therapist before that they don't get as good of rapport and trust with the patient that they or the new clinician they see. And then your competence. This is kind of one area where I consider 
myself to be a little bit above and beyond. Even if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm confident in what I'm doing. I will fake it. You know, that whole story of fake it till you make it. I've told the story a couple times. I don't know if I told it to your class. I remember it was, I want to say it was my fourth week working at the hospital after I got my license and went and treated a total knee replacement patient. Worked through the whole program with them. And at the end of the session, the patient goes, you know that my right knee or my left knee is the one I had surgery on and you just worked my right knee. And I just looked at him and said, yeah, I know that. But, you know, I know we've been working on that left side. I figured I'd even you out for one session. And the patient's like, oh, well, that makes sense. And I walked out of the room going, oh, my God, I can't believe I just did that. But the patient didn't know it. They thought it was something they were supposed to do. Can't bill for a darn dime of that. But to them, they thought that was normal. Right? I have done ultrasound without turning the machine on. I will openly admit it. I've sat there and done eight minutes of ultrasound. I'm sitting there going, man, why is this timer not going off? And looked over and went, oh, forgot to hit start. Right? Patient doesn't know it. I never was like, oh, son of a, no. Just move on like nothing ever happened. Um, the more confident you are, the more the patients will actually trust you as well. We have to understand the relationship and the kind of the understanding of the physical therapist assistant and concept of the patient's problem. They will trust and respect you more if they know you know about their condition and if you listen to them. Assist in the management of the patient and provide a therapeutic outlet for the patient to voice concerns about his or her problem. Oh boy, whether you guys want to, if, whether you know it or not, you have stepped into becoming a mini psychologist because you may be the only people that listen to the patient. PT doesn't have time. They have to get in and out of that eval as quick as possible. Sometimes 15 minutes, like they did with me. Um, but patients are gonna spend a lot of time talking to you. Now you're gonna have to work through what needs to be talked about and what doesn't need to be talked about. But they are gonna voice concerns to you and you're gonna have to tease through because sometimes the PT may not have gotten the full story and you guys are gonna get the full story from the patient. Um, I had a patient once that I was working with them and we had prescribed, um, trying to think what we're, oh, it was um, the PT had ordered those shoulder and it was left shoulder, I remember, and the PT ordered ultrasound and east end of that left shoulder. And I'm working with the patient doing their exercises before I did the ultrasound and the east end. And you know, they're telling me about how, you know, about six months ago they had their pacemaker implanted. Like, oh, what did you tell Bob about the pacemaker? Oh, you know, you know, it totally slipped my mind. I never told him about it. What would have happened if I would have done e-stem on that shoulder? I could have damaged the pacemaker, right? I could have literally killed them, right? But because I teased a little bit more information out of them, I was able to get more information from them. We really do become mini psychologists with them. And when we talk about chronic pain management, you're going to find a lot of treating chronic pain patients is just listening to them. Listening and saying to them something that a lot of people don't say is, I understand you're in pain. And I'm not going to minimize your pain. Because most people try to minimize it. It's not that bad. Pain, pain is a literal pain. So what are some of our roles? Educating the patient about the disorder being treated. We still want to keep them educated, but we are not experts. We are not doctors. We shouldn't be explaining the ins and outs of what lupus means. We shouldn't be explaining the ins and outs of ALS. That's for the primary care physician to do. But we do have to provide them with how that's going to relate to their life. We have to be working on their plan of care and their to understand it. We have to encourage the patient, right? We have to be cheerleaders. Um, one of the activities we would have done, one of the labs we would have done is actually done some exercises and then done some exercises where people are cheering you on. And it's amazing what you find is cheering somebody on or having cheerleaders there and giving them that little bit of an extra drive um, does amazing things for actual endurance and actual progression of activity. It'll be curious if when we go back to sports, you know, NBA, NHL, and in NFL, all those ends, 
and we don't have crowds, will we have the same level of competition that we had with the crowds are there? It's going to be interesting to see. Uh, provide selected interventions, right? Everything we do is an intervention. Make observations about the patient and collect and record the data. And then see, understand, and accurately relay that information to the physical therapist. Um, so that's all going to come into play. We are going to become the link between the PT and the patient from the lowercase PT to the uppercase PT. So we work with the rehabilitation team. And a lot of times, all of these uh, therapists, I'm going to use therapists as a term, are going to be under the director of rehab. Audiologists deal with hearing. Dietitians, I think you can figure out what they deal with. We have nursing, we have OTs and occupational therapist assistants, or as they're usually called as CODAs, certified occupational therapist assistants. We have physicians, we have clinical psychologists, and we also have medical psychologists that come out there. There's two different types. There's psychiatrists as well. Rehabilitation counselors, respiratory therapists, and SLPs and SLPAs are out there as well. So all of that works in our team, and a lot of times we're working hand in hand with one or more of those. So you have to understand what each of those does. You don't have to understand how a psychologist does what a psychologist does, but you have to understand that they're gonna deal with the mental well-being of the patient and how what you do contributes to what that psychologist is doing. A dietitian is gonna prescribe a specific diet for a patient. You can help reinforce that diet by providing them with feedback and you wanna make sure you are. So communication is kind of the hallmark of a great team. Should maximize recovery for each patient. The more you can communicate with all the clinicians assigned to that patient, the better they are. A lot of hospitals will do rounds where one member of each team gets together and discusses every patient on the floor. It's a really effective way of getting everyone on the same page. Communicate open and freely. Communicate honest and respectfully, right? You have to be able to be able to communicate with doctors. Um, some people, how many of you guys find doctors intimidating? Like if you actually had to call up a doctor and talk to them, how many of you would be a little concerned and a little find to be jerks? Okay, that's fair. Well, and Kelly, you also have a different background too, right? You have a little background in marketing, so it's a little easier for you to communicate with doctors because you already kind of have the ability to sell yourself. So that's kind of really what you're doing. You have to be able to do that when you're dealing with them. Um, so it's a really good thing, but you're right. Some of them, I, I, one of my best friends is an orthopedic surgeon, right? And I always joke with, or he actually joked with me the one time, and I, I still to this day remember this. He told me, what's the difference between God and an orthopedic surgeon? Does anyone know? God doesn't think he's an orthopedic surgeon. Right? And if you ever deal with orthopedic surgeons, it's pretty accurate. They really do think they're God. Um, cardiothoracic surgeons are worse. Right? But they can be intimidating, especially. And a lot of times, a lot of them will use their education as a defense mechanism. And the minute that you can show them that you know what you're doing, that defense mechanism can break down. You know, the one of the docs I work with that I told you about that said about this, the joke, I remember the first time I changed the dressing on a patient and I changed the dressing we used. So the patient was starting to develop an infection with a total knee replacement. So I went with a silver infused dressing instead of just using a regular dressing. And I remember the doc came tearing out of the room after he took the dressing off and screamed at the nurse, who put that dressing on the patient? And literally, I was across the room, and the nurse is going like this, pointing into the room to me. And man, he came into the room, and he started yelling at me. And I remember looking at the patient, I said, tell you what, give me a second. I want to go talk to him real quick. So I politely asked him, I said, hey, when you have a concern, can we not do this in front of a patient, first of all? Right? And then I said, and he said, what's the, I said, what's the problem with the dressing? He goes, well, I didn't order silver dressings for this patient. I said, well... I came in, he had fungal discharge from the wound, said it was really foul, it was kind of milky. I said, I knew it was starting to develop an infection. I said, so I figured until you got here with your expert opinion to determine what was the best course of action for this patient, I would try to minimize that infection as much as possible to help the patient have a good outcome from you. And 
And all of a sudden he's like, uh, 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 okay. And it's, then he, then he hit me back with, if you're going to change my dressings on my patients, can you call me first? That's a reasonable request. Absolutely. And from then on, we've had a really good relationship, but that could have went south 10 different ways. Right? When he came in screaming at me when I'm working with a different patient, I could have just as well gone back and snapped back at him. Right? But you have to be able to communicate respectfully and honestly. And I had to let him know that I wasn't going to tolerate him talking to me that way. But at the same time, I had to respect him being the primary doctor. So respect goes both ways. And a lot of times for docs, it's a little hard. You know, they've lived their lives, especially after they've gotten been in the field for a while, where everyone thinks they are like them fully, right? And sometimes you have to knock them down a peg. I love knocking DOs down a peg because they're the same as PTs, in my opinion. Uh, communicate professionally, right? For me, this is really, even for you guys, for me, this is really difficult. I grew up military, right? And then followed. I grew up in locker rooms. My language outside of the workplace is definitely not the same as the language I use with you guys. And sometimes that slips through. Um, you know, I've been known to drop an F-bomb every now and then or drop some curse words. And I've actually gotten some reviews where I actually did it while I was getting reviewed. And that was fantastic of me. Um, but professional communication is key. Right? Cursing at somebody is not going to get you anywhere. Now, I mean, it may in the military. That's what they always did for us. Um, but professional language leads certain ways. Using medical terminology with patients or professionals and lay terms with patients, right? I talk about you guys, when we talk, we are going to talk in terms of clavicles and scapulas. But when you talk to patients, it's going to be shoulder blades and collarbones. You need to be able to switch between those interchangeably. And then also using language appropriate to the patient's comprehension. You have to understand in this state, the average education is seventh grade. Think about that for a second. The average education in this state is seventh grade. You have to be able to bring your tone down to a seventh grade level when you're talking to patients a lot of times. How do you get a great team? Listen, demonstrate interest in the speaker. How do, I, how do I know when I'm teaching class if you guys are listening? How do I know? Head nods, eye contact, right? What did I just do? Yeah, ask questions, right? Intrinsically, I just did it to get feedback from you guys, right? I leaned into you. I had to pay attention to what you're doing. My hand posture is important, right? What does this say? It says sour kid, right? Closed off everything. So all of that comes into play. I can tell if you're not listening too, right? Because when I see this, I know you've got your phone. <laughs> There's nothing between in your legs right now that's that important that I you're searching for, right? So I know when you're paying attention when you're not. And that's a lot of times the way I gauge my classes when I need to give breaks. If I see everyone kind of drifting off, then I know it's time to get a break because it's not helping you guys. Um, I don't fully agree with the new millennial mindset that you guys should get a 15-minute break every 45 minutes. Um, that's not the way, way the real world works. Right? You guys are going to be lucky in physical therapy to get your breaks. I'm going to be honest, especially if you work in the hospital. You know, it was pretty lucky when I actually got a lunch when I worked in the hospital. What's a 15 exactly, right? Um, most of the times, I, I always joke that lunch, lunches and breaks are times to do documentation. You really need to get out of that habit if you are in, clinic, in the clinic because that's really setting a bad tone. That's letting your employer take advantage of you. Right? You should be able to complete most of your work during your normal shift and not when it's your time. Make sure you do get your time as well. And don't take work home with you. I, I should practice what I preach. 
Um, provides opportunity to understand the patient's concept of the problem situation. Provides opportunity to compare verbal and nonverbal communication. Patients may trust to be more comfortable with a good listener. If you listen, if you spend five minutes listening to little Sally talk about her problems at home, it's amazing how much that leads into her being a compliant patient. Sometimes it's as simple as that. Uh, be proactive in supervising patients, meaning if you see something doing wrong, fix it. Use probing questions. Don't use yes, no, closed-ended questions. The more closed-ended questions you use, the less information you get. Are you in pain? Yes, no, it's like one of those things, you remember the little, the paper things you used to fold it? What's your favorite color? Blue, you know, all those things, same idea. Using those simple questions doesn't really get you anywhere. Tell me about your pain's different, right? How does that feel when I do this? Gets you some feedback. What do you think about this exercise? It sucks. Okay, great. What, what don't you like about it? Or what do you like about it? Any of those type of feedbacks you get provides an insight into what the patient's thinking at that given time. It's really important. So close into questions I talked about, yes, no answers, limited feedback from the patient. They are useful in some circumstances, but a lot of times I try to avoid them, right? Where is your pain? Here, right? Now, when we talk about stuff like this, we do need to use some closed-ended questions, right? When you first talk to a patient, you want some closed-ended questions. You want, do they consent to treatment? Yes, no, right? Where is your pain? It's here. What type of pain is it? What is the level? All that stuff. We do we need some of those closed-ended questions. We also need a lot of more open-ended where we get some feedback from them, right? Behavior styles. Oh, this is big. And all of us have a, when I say dominant, I'm not meaning dominant as in this type of behavior style, but all of us have a dominant behavior style, right? Whether you like it or not, you've got a behavior style that you use. Some people have a very dominant where they're exercising control or influence. And when you have two dominant people coming together, that can be a challenge, right? If you are more of a dominant personality and you encounter a patient that is very dominant, Heads are going to butt, right? And for those of you that are in relationships, think about your personalities. Are your personalities 100% match, meaning they're the exact same? I'm going to guess they're probably not. That there are certain parts of personalities that you see in your significant other that are matches to your side of your personality. That would be the ideal relationship. Same thing here with your patients. If you know they're a heavy, dominant patient, you may actually have to adjust your style and go to a more submissive or passive style in order to comply and get them to comply with what you want them to do, right? You have to lead them to thinking they're leading, even though they're not, you're in charge still, right? A passive style doesn't always mean that you accept everything you do and that accept whatever's coming your way. A passive style means that you kind of react more than proactive. You do tend to let things happen a little bit slower pace, but you still can help and adjust those things. Hostile, right? These are patients that are insensitive to others and their needs, and you can lead to a hostile reaction, right? I'm gonna use our current environment that we're in right now, right? If you look across the world and look at these, pro or across the country, and you look at these protests, and I don't know, if, has, have any of you guys seen the, re the picture from the Lincoln Memorial from yesterday? Right? What did, the Lincoln Memorial from yesterday had National Guardsmen standing there in full riot gear on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. To me, coming from a military background, that bothers me. I don't want to be deployed in my own home country. That's not what my job is. Right? That definitely prevent, presents a hostile environment. When you see police with riot shields and batons, that leads to a hostile environment. You know, a cop gets out of his car and unsnaps the buckle on his pistol. That's already leading to a hostile environment. You guys can lead to a hostile environment. If you come into your therapy session, right? Let's say you just got off the phone call with your significant other and your significant other and you just had a 15 minute fight over the phone. You can carry that into your environment with your patient and come in hostile. Right? You need to be really good 
And what happens outside of work stays outside of work, and what happens inside of work stays in work. It's a really difficult task to do. But when you learn that once you cross the threshold of work, it's work time, and once you cross that threshold from work, it's now no more work time, it's personal time, it makes your life a lot easier. Or being responsive and sensitive to others feels and needs. Um, this is one area that I feel I need to work on. Um, everyone always says that, no, no, you're fine. Uh, I, I personally feel that I'm not as receptive. I, I tend to come off a little bit aloof and a little bit standoffish. Um, usually when I, the first time that people, especially when the students first time meet me, I don't know if you guys experience this or not, but a lot of people, when they say they first meet me, they, they're intimidated by the way I present myself. I don't know why. I don't think I'm intimidating that much. I mean, I can be mean, I guess, if I want. Um, if you ask my godchildren, they think I'm a giant teddy bear. Actually, a giant jungle gym. But warmth is an area that you kind of present, right? Again, the posture leads a lot to it, right? The way you present yourself. Which concern, regard, or responsiveness are big for that warmth. So prompting versus cueing. This is going to come into play with your documentation because I see a lot of clinicians use this incorrectly. Prompting is where you present a question to lead them somewhere, right? So did you do that exercise the way I showed you how to do it? That's a prompt. A cue is hey, when you did that exercise, you were contracting primarily biceps and I want your fist up so we can contract primarily your brachioradialis. That's a cue. So prompt is a question leading them to think about what they did. Cue is kind of giving them a straight direction. You can have verbal cues and you can have tactile cues. Verbal cues are me saying something. Tactile cues are me getting hands on with the patient. You have to learn when tactile cues are appropriate. Again, I learned this the hard way as a student. Um, one of my clinical affiliations was at a special needs pediatrics facility where in a community in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And Lancaster, Pennsylvania is primarily a predominant Amish and Mennonite community. And for those of you that don't know, the Amish and Mennonites tend to live a simpler life than all of us. The Amish actually don't even have electricity. Mennonites at least allow for electricity. But I remember I had a girl that I was working with. She was 14 years old and had scoliosis. And we were doing some, uh, we were playing Wii tennis. I remember exactly what we were doing. And she constantly was kind of leaning into her scoliotic curve. And I kept manually correcting her with tactile cueing. And my clinical instructor pulled me aside because her dad had seen me tactilely correct her. And evidently, I didn't realize this, and I, this was something I didn't know from their, you know, their culture, is that no male can touch a female if they are not married to them or if they are not direct family. Literally, what I did could get her shunned from her community and get her kicked out completely from her community. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's kind of scary, right? And I felt like a complete jackass because I didn't know it. And I, I, I apologize. I didn't understand it. And I, what I did then at that point was open up and say, explain it to me. Let me understand how this works so that I can help her be better. Uh, father was not very understanding. The mother was. Father was not very understanding at all. And you find that a lot in the Amish community. Um, that was, the Amish don't have time for English. That's what they call us. We're the English because we have technology. Um, but we're called the English. But it was a really eye-opening experience to me that I understood that. I gave that tactic. So I'd switch to more verbal cueing. And when I switched to verbal cueing, everything was okay. But it's kind of scary when you do stuff like that. Scales and measurements, right? Strength, we're going to talk about. You guys talked a little bit about that with Dr. Johnson. Right, with fair, good, poor strength grades, we're going to take that a step further and start going into a zero to five scale of strength grading, manual muscle testing. Pain, analoxia. One thing for pain, and I heard a couple of you a little bit with this when we, we actually were in modalities way back when. Understand that when you ask patients the pain scale, you have to ask them on a scale of zero to 10. It's not one to 10. 
the patient has to have the ability to have no pain. If not, you're leading the patient and saying that they have to be in pain. It's a Jayco thing, and Jayco is one of the companies that are the main things that oversee hospitals. So when you're asking that pain scale, it seems kind of silly. It's only a minor change, but it's on a scale of zero to 10. Where is your pain at? Swelling, we can measure, right? Coordination, we can definitely check. Stretch reflex, right? You guys did that with DTRs. Uh, range of motion, everything like that, we can kind of go through with specific measurements. Modifications during treatments. So a lot of people think that we can't make any changes to a patient's treatment plan. And you're gonna run into PTs that feel that way. And I'm sorry about that, but they're wrong. PTAs can make adjustments in the patient's treatment plan either after consulting with the PT or as long as it stays within the PT's plan of care. You can change exercises, you can change activities, you can change modalities, as long as it still falls within the patient's plan of care. You will have to learn your PTs. This, this, we have a lot more responsibility for this than the PTs do. The PTs don't have to learn anything about what we do. They don't care. And most PTs don't have had zero training in how to deal with a PTA. I think you're a glorified tech. And it's kind of disappointing. But the more you show them the stuff you can do, the more they'll be comfortable in letting you do stuff. I've worked with PTs where I can't even add reps and sets without clearing with them. You know, I patients doing 10 reps, three set or three sets, 10 reps, and I want to go to three sets, 15 reps. I have to go to that PT and clear it with them. Great. I know for that PT, I've got to do that. Other PTs literally hand me the eval and say, figure it out. And they don't even give me a plan of care, or a real like flow sheet or anything. I've got to do everything myself. That's one of the reasons why I liked working in acute care because there wasn't this hard. Yeah, here in Vegas too. Yep. Um, they're working in acute care, especially working in neuro care. They can't give you a flow sheet to go off of because every day is different. But there are PTs here in Vegas that you will work with that are die hard. You will do what I tell you to do and only what I tell you to do. If you do anything else, you're violent, I'm gonna call you to the floor on it. Great, you just learn to deal with those PTs. They're wrong, but you do learn to deal with them. You can learn it. We identify objective changes in the patient's status, right? We begin with the least drastic change in exercise prescription, then progress, right? We can always add reps and sets, but we have to learn when we add weights and when we don't add weights, when we do TheraBand and when we do free weights. All of that comes into play and you're gonna learn in this class when we kind of make those changes. Provide information to the PT on a daily basis. We don't always have to talk to the daily basis to the PT. We don't physically have to talk to them. But our notes should be good enough that a PT can understand exactly what we did with the patient. Your documentation needs to be that clear that if I've never seen your patient, I can follow you. And that's one of my goals when I do documentation on a patient is I try to make sure that, you know, if they I have a Go away. If I have a PRN or a part-timer following me in the clinic, they need to be able to do exactly the same way I did the exercises, regardless of the way they're trained. So that documentation needs to be on point is what I'm saying. Again, understand the different philosophies of PTs. They're usually directed by the physician, but even some physicians are different. Um, Dr. Johnson here in town, I'm going to use him as a great example. Dr. Johnson's one of the orthopedic surgeons here in town. Dr. Johnson has a protocol for every single one of his patients. If they're a total knee, he's got a total knee protocol. If they're a total hip, he's got a total hip protocol. Shoulder, whatever it is, whatever type of surgery he has, he has a protocol for it. He sends those to the PTs. The PTs then give them to the PTAs to treat the patients. We are not allowed to vary from his protocols. His protocols are his protocols. Boom, follow him to the T. Um, his ACL protocols are very, very rigid. So an ACL repair. If he says no closed chain activity with this patient for six weeks, that means no closed chain activity with this patient for six weeks. You have to understand that. And same thing with the PT. So the PT has got to be guided by those physicians. We need to be guided by the PTs. Each PD has a different background, level of experience and education. 
not all PTs are DPTs. Some of them are still old bachelors of PTs. Doesn't mean that they're less than DPT. And despite whatever those DPTs may think, those PTs have a lot of information and they've been treating patients a long time. Despite what a PT, a new grad DPT may think, I know quite a bit. And I struggle a lot of times with new grad PTs that come out thinking they know everything. And they do. Ooh boy. Especially the younger ones. Sorry. But they come out thinking they know everything. And sometimes they don't. And it can be embarrassing when that happens, when they show that they don't know it. And I have to make sure that I don't embarrass them. Uh, PTs do a variety of protocols to manage a patient. Variances will occur. It's not our job to modify the treatment plans or protocols without the supervising PT's direction and approval. We can't complete or change goals without a PT's approval. A uh, big example in the inpatient world. If the PT has not evaluated the patient for gait or ambulation, getting up and walking, we can't walk them. They have to evaluate them before we can do it. So there are a lot of rules and regulations we have to know, which we have a lot more rules than they have. But to minimize any confusion by effectively and efficiently communicating with the supervisor and PT. PT is ultimately responsible for the physical therapy interventions. They're also ultimately responsible for us. If we lead to a case of a patient being hurt, the PT is just as responsible as we are. Their license is just as much on the line as ours is, right? So we have to identify key elements of any disagreements that happen, seek an appropriate explanation from the supervising PT and learn the PT, understand their rationale. A lot of times when I start a new clinic, my first couple of days, I don't play my cards. I don't explain how good I am at or anything because what I wanna see is what the PT expects. I wanna know what they expect of me before I go and just tell them what I know. This is what I know, this is how I do it, this is what, I want to know what they expect of me first. And we have, again, it's a little more difficult for us to do this. What's our goal for assessment here? Well, we're going to talk about all these terms here. The APTA's guiding documents is the guide to physical therapy practice. When you're an APTA member, you get unlimited access. It used to send us the guide to physical therapy practice, the book like that thick. Now it's online only. Thank you. It describes physical therapist practice in general. Right, it standardizes terminology, delineates the preferred practice patterns, promotes appropriate use of healthcare services, and increases efficiency and reduces unwarranted variation. This is where a lot of states get things wrong because this is the definition of a PTA, a technically educated individual who assess the or assists the physical therapist in the provisioning of selected physical therapist interventions. Physical therapist assistants under the direction and supervision of the PT are the only individuals who assist physical therapists in the provision of selected interventions. The PTA is a graduate of a PTA program accredited by CAPTI. So there's a key term in this whole definition of a PTA that we miss. And this is why if you ask the APTA to take a stance on text, they will say, we have taken a stance on text because according to them, there is no such thing as a tech because the key phrase there is are the only individuals who assist the physical therapist. Cut and dry. We are the only ones who see patients other than the physical therapist. So why do we have techs? And I'm not picking on you guys at our techs. Please don't think I am. A little bit maybe. But right, that's why we develop these techs is because they're cheaper. And it's not right. By the guide to physical therapy practice, a PT should never delegate any responsibility to a tech. Period. In Pennsylvania, we make it very clear because the states are gonna be ultimately responsible for regulating this. In the Pennsylvania regulation, it says that a physical therapy technician is somebody who provides non-billable services. 
non-billable services. What are examples of non-billable services? Folding laundry, bringing the patients back to the clinic, cleaning the clinic. That's all a PT, a tech can do in Pennsylvania. They may provide no intervention because once you get an intervention, it's a billable service that has to come from a PT or a PTA. I think that was very, that's pretty clear. I don't know, I like that terminology, obviously, because I come from PA and I helped write some of that terminology. When I tried to introduce that here in Nevada, guess what happened? You think that went as well as I was expecting? It went over like the, um, yeah, it went over, I always, we have a term back in Pennsylvania, it went over like the proverbial fart in church. Patient care is considered billable. Yep. Anything that has an associated CPT code with it is a billable service. So for those that are techs, you're sitting here going, man, in PA, I'd be violating the laws. Yep. And it was funny when we started that process, because what happened was Medicare came in and audited Pennsylvania. And we have a couple major conglomerates. Like around here, we have UMC and we have the Valley Health System. We have a couple of big, really big conglomerates like that in PA that manage whole swaths of land. One of them was the one I worked for, which is Wellspan. Wellspan has like 22 hospitals, 140 outpatient clinics, crazy big. They got fined something like $2.3 billion for Medicare. because they found out that unregulated personnel was providing treatment. All of a sudden, changes happened. And now, so that's the thing is, so you're seeing it, you can provide CNA services and there's specific codes that you're allowed to do as a CNA. Um, but for example, say you are walking a patient as a CNA, you're not gonna bill for that. Right, that comes under normal patient care for a CNA and you fall under the nurse's license, right? So if you screw up, it's on the nurse. So you are effectively under the nurse for that care. You couldn't do PTA, you couldn't do nothing, anything as a PTA for them. Now, say you wanted to change the patient. Absolutely, you could do that. You can do that as a PTA or a CNA, right? The only difference is I can actually bill it as a um, activity of daily living. Whereas CNAs, I don't think can bill it as an activity of daily living. Right? So there are ways we can, we can get around this. This is a really important phrase to me is that we are the only ones supposed to be providing care. Um, I know I'm hard about this. Part of this is job protection. The more I see techs coming into the field, the less job op opportunities I have and the less job opportunities you guys have. All right? I hope you guys eventually feel as strongly about techs as I do, but I, you know, I don't expect everyone to. But understand that the more techs that are out there, the less job opportunities exist for you guys. And initially what happened is when we went out and got rid of the techs, initially PTA salaries took a little bit of a dip and then they came right back up to where they were. Because that was the big argument as well. If we go to, we go to PTAs only, your salaries are gonna suck. Nope, a little bit of a dip for, it took about $2 dip for about three years and then everything normalized. And guess what? We got better care from the patients and we also build better. Uh, physical therapy is provided by a physical therapist or under the direction and supervision of physical therapist assistants in accordance with these policies. Now there are some job or some things that PTs can do that we can't. Sharp's debris is an excellent example of that. We have to understand what interventions are fall under our scope of practice and what don't, right? Standards of ethical conduct for PTA and a PTA fall under the APTA again. Now the APTA kind of is our governing body for what we should and shouldn't do. Our licensing bodies are our boards. So although the APTA will set us up with kind of what we can and can't do, the boards are responsible for managing what we can and can't do. They're the ones that are gonna fine us. Ethics are there to hold us to certain standards, right? So here's the eight standards. I am not gonna read all of these because this is a pain in the butt and you guys do need to know your ethics 
things know, right? The main thing here is don't be stupid, right? You know, hold your competence. Keep going on for more knowledge. Keep learning. Support organizational behavior. Support your patients. Be there and participate both nationally, locally, and globally, right? The APTA has actually come out and made some stances on the stuff that's going on right now because they understand that this is a national problem that's going on with systemic racism. The APTA had to come out and say something about it, right? All of this comes into play with us. We have both standards that we have to follow here in the state. We also have national standards we have to adhere to. All of that comes into play. But really, when you look at what our ethics are is, don't be stupid. Don't date a patient. Just saying. Um, I thought we learned, I thought I learned this. And one of the things I, you know, in my business classes I learned in high school, but I didn't really teach business classes anymore is you don't date in your workplace because it doesn't turn out well. Some of you might have learned that the hard way. Right? So all of that comes into play. Just don't be stupid. Or Jim, yeah. Right? Our core values in the PT profession are accountability. Are we accountable for what we do? Are we altruistic? Do we want the best for our patients? Hopefully we do. Are we compassionate and caring? Do we have a strive for excellence? Do we have some integrity? Do we own when we make mistakes and fix those mistakes? Do we have a professional duty to our communities? And do we have to take on a social responsibility? Do we still contribute to our society? Do we go out and do things like donating blood? Do we go out and participate in food drives? All of that, all of that comes into play. So that all comes into our core values. You know, when we have problems like COVID, do we rally together and help the general healthcare community? I hope we do. The CPI, you guys are going to encounter this on your first clinical affiliation. The CPI is the clinical performance instrument. Dr. Reskin will go into a whole long class about this. But this is something the APTA put together as a uniform clinical education grading tool that will help determine how you guys perform as a student in the field. Ultimately, we want to get you to where you're an entry level performer. We are not, you should never, when you graduate a program, be graded as, you know, as effective as a normal PTA. You're not there yet. But you're going to eventually be graded on this criterion that kind of grades you from a novice to an entry level performer. And where do you fall on that scale? That gives you things to work towards. Um, I don't claim to be a CPI expert. Dr. Reskin certainly is. This is where we're going to stop and pick this back up. So this is a good area to stop and come back on I think when I have this class next, I think I have this class next on Tuesday. So we'll pick this class up on Tuesday. I can tell I'm starting to lose some of you guys. Even though I'm not seeing you, I can tell I'm starting to lose you guys because it's getting a little slower in response. So I'm going to stop the sharing here and stop recording here. Uh, stop recording.